morning, everyone, and welcome to the Reflation Women's Conference 2021. My name is Doreen Abisundra, and I'm going to be your MC for today's webinar. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're ready to ignite the power, and let me turn the webinar to Jyok to make an opening address and to introduce our first guest of honor. Over to you, Jyok. Wow, I can feel the power and the energy pulsating through the cyber airwave. I welcome everybody. Good morning, Senior Minister of State, Ms. Anne Sim, um, Minister of State, Ms. Fan Xiao Huang, Principal of RGS, Ms. Haslinda, Immediate Past Principal of RGS, Mrs. Poman Si, Staff of RGS, Students of RGS, Brothers from RI, my esteemed panels of speakers, friends, from Singapore and friends from overseas. On behalf of the RGS alumni, I bid all of you a very warm welcome to our Reflection Women's Conference 2021. The theme of our conference this year is igniting the power within. Power, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the capacity or ability to direct or influence change in others or change in course of events. Each and every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, have a personal perception of power. Today, we hope to bring these perspectives to the fore, to exchange and share ideas and insights on the concept of power. In panel one, Wonder Women Decoded, we will examine the anatomy of the female power, expression of power and challenges, and igniting the power within. The speakers in panel two will share their experiences of imbalance of power, power struggles, what they have done to cope with it and overcome it, what we can do to restore the imbalance. I'm looking forward to the deep and exciting conversations we will be having this morning. In igniting the power within, we can bring significance into what we do with the power we have, which will result in success success in the lives we touch, success in the lives we influence to do good, and success to make a difference. That is our legacy, our footprint in the universe. I now declare the conference open, and it is with great pleasure and honor that I invite our first guest of honor, Senior Minister of State, Ms. Sim An, Ministries of National Development and Foreign Affairs to share with us her thoughts and perspective on igniting the power within. Before I call upon Ms. Sim An, I'd like to share with you a personal anecdote. Ms. Sim An is a reflection who epitomizes the value of being an active creator of change. Last year, when RGS alumni was raising funds for children under the Child Protection Services, I approached Minister An and told her about our fundraiser Without hesitation, Minister N wrote a check and together with other initiatives and RGS alumni, we were able to raise $15,000 for therapy for these abused children under the Child Protection Act. This is Ms. Sim N and it's with honor that I hand over the virtual mic to you, Minister N. Thank you very much, Georgina, and uh, very good morning to everyone who's here at the Reflection Women's Conference 2021. It is a great honor to be invited to join all of you this morning. I wanted to say that when Georgina invited me to open today's event uh, a few months ago, I agreed readily. And I actually, at that point in time, didn't even know what the theme was going to be. And the reason why I agreed without hesitation is because Georgina is someone whom it's very hard to say no to. Uh, I think that's also how all of our panel speakers ended up here today. They all could not say no to Georgina because who can say no to someone who is so persuasive, who's so passionate and who's always thinking about creating value for the school, for the students and also for the alumni. So I, I consider that someone who fits the dictionary definition of having a lot of power within 
Um, and I think Georgina, you just described yourself very aptly. So I think while the most suitable person to expound on this theme is none other than our, our president, Georgina, uh, since I promised her that I will speak today, let me do my best, let me try my best. I want to begin by um, thinking about the, this question, is it a good time to be a woman in Singapore? In many ways, it is the best of times because we have come so far. Women have been doing very well in terms of education. Um, we have been doing very well in the field of employment. I see women breaking new ground in many areas, many exciting professions, um, some of whom I've also met through RGSA's earlier events where we have invited people who are entrepreneurs who are founders and who are influential in their fields, many of which are new and emerging. So I would say in many ways, it is the best of times because the opportunities for women, I think have never been more diverse or more rich. But in some ways, I think it's also not necessarily the best of times because although we have dismantled some barriers to women's success, I've mentioned just now in terms of education, in terms of access to professions and general employment. While we dismantle these barriers, there are still some left. And the ones that are left, I think tend to also be the most stubborn mindsets that have persisted through centuries and actually in many ways have also shaped relations between men and women in different societies across the world. And a trend that I think is very concerning is that some of these age old societal prejudices have been given new life through digitalization. And in fact, I think are seeking in a way new victims behind the cloak of anonymity online. I do some work uh, on uh, tackling online harms that are targeted against women and girls together with my colleague, Parliamentary Secretary, Ms. Rahayu Mazam, and together we co-lead the Sunlight Alliance for Action against online harms targeted at women and girls. And in doing so, we have had the opportunity to come together with many like-minded men and women who are very concerned about the amount of sexual harassment, unwanted advances, and hypersexualized communications that increasingly women and girls find themselves subject to online. And this is an area of um, urgency, I think, for society. At the same time, I've also been speaking with our educators. And I know that girls, including girls from our school, increasingly also face pressures that could affect their mental well being. There is the pressure to excel. I think many of you feel it. There's also the pressure to not appear elitist while excelling. So that I think is a double pressure, uh, particularly I think from schools that are very popular. And perhaps our girls feel pressure to look a certain way, uh, pressure to behave in a certain way, pressure to be liked. Uh, and many of these pressures, I think, uh, come through their experiences in the digital world. And this is something that I believe parents, our teachers, our principals are all very concerned about. What should our response be to this range of opportunities, but also challenges that face women of all ages? I think it is very timely for us to think about where our power lies. And this is also the reason why I resonate a lot with today's theme. Please allow me to make three brief points. For me, the power of women is very often found in the collective. So it's not just about what individually we can achieve, but also the strength that we draw from being part of a group or part of a community. Our school believed in that, and I think gave us a very good start in working together with one another. The RGS that I remember and which I enjoyed my time in so much was one in which girls were encouraged to compete, undoubtedly, but always as part of a team or of a bigger collective. Ours was a school that celebrated well-roundedness through the house system and active CCA culture. And I also think that perhaps 
there were some progressive elements of British boarding school culture that was brought to Singapore by some of our earliest headmistresses. Through this um, mix of uh, collective practices in school, many girls were given this opportunity to self-organize and to lead. Very importantly, we learned from our seniors and guided our juniors uh, in turn. I think our current principal, uh, Haslinda, uh, might resonate with this because I remember her very well as a role model and a house captain from my days in school. So I think we promoted, I think, quite a rugged ethos, which um, now that I think back, I think serves us very well. The second point that I would like to um, make is that when it comes to igniting the power within, it's worthwhile thinking about whether we self-ignite or whether we are ignited by others. Now, my take on this is that it's a bit of both. I think that many of us, including everyone in this Zoom room, are self-starters. But at the same time, um, someone like me, I find that uh, I am ignited by the enthusiasm and the ideas of others when I encounter them. For me, the best kind of conversations are those where everyone in the conversation are so animated that we just can't help interrupting each other because the ideas are just flowing so readily and we're just bouncing um, initiatives off one another. I think this speaks to the power of empathy, which is so closely associated with women. For me, the best form of inspiration also comes from women particularly women who've had more experience in life than I have, who've looked at me and told me what they thought I could be, which I think is very important because women, we are also very often our worst critics. Many of you would have heard of um, the imposter syndrome. I've encountered so many women who are admirable, who are successful, and they also share with me that, you know, this is something that afflicts them too. So I feel that having someone look at us from the outside and affirm us and tell us what we can be, I think is incredibly important. So having been myself a beneficiary of wiser women who have given me the confidence to be more, I also seek to make time for mentorship and I encourage more of you to also do so. And the third point I'd like to make is that each of us can make good things happen for someone else. We can show up for others. We can notice what they do and tell them who or what you think they can be, even if, and especially if, they don't yet believe it themselves. I think this is an experience that many of us have had in school and it's something that we can replicate for others as well. So let me end off by encouraging everyone to let someone else catch fire from your flame. And I think that's the reason why we're all here today. I'm going to hand this time back over to Georgina and also to the team who have organized today's seminar so painstakingly for us. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Senior Minister of State Siman, for your insight and encouragement to be a mentor. We have just caught your fire. Um, right now, we come to our first panel, Wonder Women Decoded. Um, Georg, who is the president of the RGS alumni, will be our moderator. We kindly invite the panelists to turn on their video. Over to you, Georg. Thank you, Minister Anne, for a, an amazing, enriching speech. Takes one to know one. You're a great leader. And you are one of the reasons why I'm proud to be a woman. I would like to um, warmly welcome now my distinguished panel of speakers. I will introduce them individually. The first speaker is Dr. Shalini. She's also a colonel in the army. Shalini is a commander of the SAF Medical Corps Military Medicine Institute. She was the first female recipient of a Singapore Armed Forces Scholarship to study medicine in 1998. In a military career, she has held several appointments in the Republic of Singapore Navy, including an overseas deployment to the Arabian Gulf in 2006. 
and was the commanding officer of the Medical Classification Center in MINDEF from 2016 to 2018. She was seconded to the Singapore Civil Service Force, Civil Defense Force, as its chief medical officer from 2018 to June 2021, where in addition to implementing protocols to protect ambulance crew and patients in the COVID pandemic, she implemented initiatives to improve paramedic education and career progression. Currently, as commander of SAF's Military Medicine Institute, she oversees the provision of health care for SAF personnel at 23 medical centers and specialty centers across Singapore. She's also leading SAF's medical task force, which is currently deployed at COVID treatment centers in support of the military of Ministry of Health. Dr. Shalini is also a consultant, ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and is a visiting consultant at the Singapore General Hospital and Sinkang Hospital. She's also a mother. She's married with three children and aged 12 to eight, and enjoys long distance running and Indian classical music. The next person that I would like to introduce is Mr. Chua Ju Hock. Ju Hock is the managing partner of Vertex Ventures, and he's passionate about working with tech startups, tech startup founders to build champions. Ju Hock has over three decades of venture capital investment and company building experience. He joined Vertex in 1987 and has led Vertex VC investments in US, Southeast Asia, India, Taiwan, and China. Prior to Vertex, he was the NetSteel Group. He was with NetSteel Group, where he was involved in VC investment and corporate development projects. This venture capitalist spent several years in manufacturing and operation in the Singapore Semiconductor Subsidiary of GE USA upon graduation from the National University of Singapore in Mechanical Engineering and also has an MBA from NUS. The next person that I would like to introduce is Xian. Xian is the managing partner of Hustle Fund. At this point, I want to congratulate Xian, who is right now um, calling in from New York. Um, two days ago, the startup that she was involved in, that she was the uh, vice president of um, business operations, uh, was launched in the, on NASDAQ and it debuted with a 55% um, price jump. Congratulations, Xian. So as I was saying, she's the managing partner of Hustle Fund. She's an experienced operator and investor. And, prior, and, and the company that she was involved in and that was launched in, in NASDAQ is called Nerd Wallet. She was also at, uh, she was an investor at Institutional Venture Partners, a growth stage venture capital fund, and also Bridgewater Associates, a global macro hedge fund. Um, as a managing partner of Hustle Fund, um, she, she, um, she raises funds for pre-stage pre-seed stage uh, companies. She holds a BS in biomechanical engineering and a BA in economics from Stanford University, as well as master's in business administration from Harvard Business School. I shall now introduce the youngest speaker in our panel, a brave young man by the name of Mr. Ng Tai Lung. Tai Lung, or affectionately called Tai, is 14 years old and he's a student from ACS. He was homeschooled from birth till he was 13 years old. He started going to ACS Baca Road this year and is in secondary two. Um, Tai just celebrated his 14th birthday. He's particularly interested in shooting with both his parents being ex-national team champions, uh, team shooters. On top of that, Tai is good at understanding people dissecting problems and coming up with ideas to resolve them. He feels that he's able to recognize and understand other people's feelings and emotions well, and has volunteered for the Coalition Against Bullying for Children and Youth, called CAPSI. In his free time, Tai Lung, like any young man, enjoys playing online games, doing sports, and exploring nearby malls with his friends. 
The fifth speaker is Ms. Georgette Tan. Ms. Georgette Tan is the president of the United Women Singapore, a non-profit organization advocating gender equality, women's empowerment, and focused on building the pipeline of future female leaders. She's on the board of Singapore Council of Women's Organization and is chair of Board Agenda, an initiative of SEWO focused on increasing the number of women on boards and senior management positions. Georgette serves on the Task Force on Family Violence, which is co-chaired by the Ministry of Social and Family Development and the Ministry of Home Affairs. Georgette was previously Senior VP Communications at MasterCard, but for over 18 years, she was responsible for external and internal communication and launched MasterCard's knowledge leadership strategy with the establishment of numerous consumer, lifestyle and gender indexes. She also spearheaded MasterCard's corporate social responsibility efforts, which focused on education and development programs to help empower women and children across Asia Pacific region. Prior to joining MasterCard, Georgia was VP of communications at CNBC Asia and Dow Jones Asia, and also held senior communications roles at the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and the Singapore Tourist Promotion Board. Georgette also advises female entrepreneurs of startup ventures and social enterprises in the region. Last but not the least is Ms. Virginia Tan. Ms. Virginia Tan, she is the founder of Teja Ventures, the first gender lens VC for emerging Asia. As a pioneering thought leader for gender and technology in Asia, She founded She Loves Tech, the world's largest startup competition for women in technology. Um, at this point, I would like to, to say that at the end of this um, conference, we will be giving out a, uh, a special code for you to attend the She Loves Tech competition that's coming up soon. Virginia Tan is also the founder and former president of Lean In China, one of China's leading nonprofit platforms for women with over 100,000 members across more than 25 cities and 100 universities in China, which supports the goals and aspirations of Chinese women. Virginia's background is in law and finance, having worked in Europe, Middle East, Asia, Africa, and South America for two magic circle firms, Clifford Chance and Allen and & Overy. She specialized in emerging market investments and has covered more than USD $30 billion of transactions in the course of her career. She moved to Beijing in 2013 to work on strategic investments related to One Belt Road Initiative. In 2020, Virginia was selected by the Rockefeller Foundation as one of the eight next-gen leaders for its Beijing 25 Plus Summit in 2020 and made Singapore's 100 Women in Tech inaugural list. We have a whole group of powerful men and women to start off our panel. I took some time to introduce these guests, uh, these speakers, because it's important to understand their background and the wisdom and perspective that they will bring when we are discussing the concept of power. Essentially, the key areas we'll be focusing on will be the anatomy of women power, the expressions and challenges of power, and how we can ignite the power within. I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Shah. Shah, could you um, share with us what are your thoughts about power? Good morning, ministers, uh, my respected uh, panelists and uh, guests. Thank you very much for the opportunity to start off this uh, session. Uh, I must say that my interpretation of power change has changed very much um, you know, from the time I started my career uh, till today. Initially, as, as you know, I, I was from the military. So when I started off my career, um, my idea of power was very much skewed towards a very you know, masculine, harsh uh, sort of uh, concept of power, uh, being able to command a group of people and lead from the front uh, you know, uh, to get people to obey and, and do, uh, do your bidding. That was actually you know, the sort of um, or the expectation of power, you know, uh, as a leader when I was in my initial few years of my career. 
but you know, as time went on, and I took on uh, different uh, posts and and kind of uh, went up uh, the hierarchy, I realized that there are many other ways to manifest power, and uh, I was able to come into my own and uh, ex actually exhibit the sort of uh, power that I felt was more me, which is a, a soft power, a, a more a power which uh, is allows you to influence people and 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 get. Uh, you know, uh, things better for your organization, for your people, for your patients or for the people that you take care of by nudging, by negotiating, by building alliances and by influencing, you know, subtly and but in a way that is still makes a lot of impact. And uh, this has been especially useful because I always find myself as the only woman in the in the boardroom uh, in the, in where I work, and uh, and this sort of a soft power actually uh, functions, uh, you know, uh, more effectively than trying to be um, to manifest a masculine uh, form of power. And I've uh, learned that you know, other than leading from the front, there are many other ways that uh, that you can exhibit your power and 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 influence, and that is by leading from the side, as as well as leading from behind looking after your people, making sure that you know, nobody falls behind, uh, making sure that everybody is okay and making strategic plans uh, to, to guide uh, the organization or, or the, the section or the department towards a better future. Thank you, Jo. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sha. I love the way you um, use power in different circumstances from the front, from the side and um, from behind when you're planning. Um, i like to check with Thai, our young gentleman. Thai, what is your definition of power? Uh, to me, power is the ability to influence, the ability to change, the ability to improve the people around you. Because I believe power is all about changing and making other people better, as well as yourself. Mm -hmm. Such powerful words from a young man. I love that. Now we go to a very wise uh, champion, um, Ju Hop. What is your definition of power? Mm, okay. You know, we are, we are all very used to the general, <coughs> general thinking about power as being dominant, control, authority over others, right? Mm. And this is really, like Shalini say, it's a very masculine way, masculine way of looking at things. Mm. Um, and power has for so long been a, a male construct. Mm. And, you know, we see that powerful women were seen as caricatures of the male colleagues. To my mm. own, I think power is the ability to influence and impact uh, with purpose. Right? Mm. Uh, power over others is very much like looking down on people. Mm. Power with impact is influencing outwards uh, from where you are and where you stand and who you are, right? Mm. And women has the innate uh, nurturing, you know, bonding, relationship building and caring power. A mother wants to protect, wants to care, wants to build a bond and, you know, to care, uh, to nurture as well. So if we can use this innate power, women leaders are somehow able to get men and women who work for them <clears throat> to do things for them. Because I feel that these women leaders help uh, these people feel better about themselves. So there's nothing wrong with women wanting power so that you can impact your family, your community, your workplace. And when you can embrace this power, uh, you are better able to em empower more women. But having said that, I also do think that uh, in many places, um, workplaces are getting more inclusive and diverse. You know, we are living in places where traditional roles have shifted. Gender is not no longer a, a factor to determine success. It used to be when brute strength counts, men have a, has an men has an advantage. But now brain power has given that. Today, effective leadership uh, we talk about uh, is more due to flexibility uh, and you know, being multi-dimensional than to rigid uh, patterns. We do not need uh, patriarchy or matriarchy. Right? Uh, we just need each other and mm -hmm. especially the most powerful among us to put away the drive for ego and to take up the 
the banner of nurturing, protection, inclusion, and care. Mm. Oh, I love what you say, um, Jihok, about the power with the purpose and that all of us has innate power within us, both men and women. And um, in exercise of that power, we require flexibility and also a multidimensional approach, um, the way Shah has mentioned as well, and that we need each other you know, um, to uh, ignite each other, to um, embrace each other and to grow in power. Thank you so much for that sharing. Um, how about you, Georgette? What is your perception of power? Uh, well, what can I say after all, all those great definitions? Um, except to echo, well, well certainly to echo um, that, look, power, everybody has power. All right. mm. It's in everybody. It, the real question is how you choose to use it. Mm. Um, whether you're a man, you're a woman, identify with different gender uh, tags, um, that power is within, but it's also outside of oneself. Mm. Um, and true power is knowing how and when to wield it. Right? I think we can choose to use it for ourselves, oneself, and there are many times that you should, but more importantly, when do you use your power? And here, I think where rightly, as, as the other panelists have done, identified it with influence. How do we use this for others, for the good of others? The word purpose comes into mind here and, and it's already mentioned by Juho. Mm. So, you know, what it is that, that we have, that we can use in our spheres, our communities, our networks, no matter how big or small they are, what it is that you can do to stand up, to speak up and to speak out for others. And I think just one other, one other point to add, um, that power is in itself or influence in itself, it can be thrust upon you, mm. right, in many instances. And um, schools are a great place to, to experience it and to build it and to nurture it. Uh, but in the same vein, it can also be taken away very easily. And there are many people around the world, many women around the world who unfortunately are suffering from the fact that power is taken away from them. The power to speak up, stand up for themselves, the power to vote, the power to go to school, be educated. So I think that as we start to talk about this innate power that we have in all of us, I think we must remember that it's so fragile, it can be taken away. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Georgette, um, for sharing that, you know, we need to stand up and speak up, speak up for ourselves and also for others. I recall uh, in my interview with you um, some weeks back, you mentioned that um, there's power in leadership and power in non-leadership. Would you like to, um, you know, elaborate a little bit on that? Oh, absolutely. I think, the, and this is where everybody has power in them. You yeah. don't have to be a leader. You don't need the tag that says you're a leader. You don't have the tag that says you're the president or the chairperson. Um, sometimes that helps. Right? I'm, not, I'm not taking that away from it. The, the, the power of that, I'm not taking mm. that away from it. Yeah. But I think everybody has the power to influence, to do good. Um, and leaders can be influencers, but you don't have to be a leader to be an influencer. Mm. I think that's, that's where true power lies. Um, to, to what the other panelists were saying, you don't have to be banging on the table and, and you know, asserting yourself and demanding attention. There is soft, quiet power that is just as effective in getting the job done, as Ty rightly put it, being, you know, being a change maker, effecting change. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, how about you, uh, Virginia? What are your thoughts about power? Virginia and Georgette has a special connection. Uh, Besides the same last name. Besides the same last name. <laughs> beyond, the same, beyond the same last name, yes. Um, when I think about power, um, I simply refer back to the Oxford Dictionary definition of power. Um, power is very simply the means um, to achieve an end. Um, I think along the way, somehow, when we think of power, I think it became a, re a really loaded word. And I noted my own resistance 
to even using the term power when I when I was first asked to do a keynote speech on power a, a couple of years ago, and I was so resistant and I didn't understand why. And I think part of that is I don't know how much of our upbringing actually encourages us to become powerful, um, to become powerful women. Though I though I believe the younger generation is probably changing and even more courageous than than us. I think power is uh, being authentic. I think power is really being yourself. And I and I look at my my own career and how I've become a lot more comfortable in my own power. I think I think in a, in, in the in, in my earlier life, I probably felt like what Georgette said. Power is something external, something that is either given, bestowed, or could be taken away. Um, and I think uh, in my early career, I probably used a lot more of so-called masculine power to get get things done. Um, I don't believe that um, you know there's male power and female power. I think there is both masculine and feminine forms of power in all of us. And you know, and and I'm I'm also against saying that okay, women should only exercise soft power. Um, you know, I, I, I believe each person, male or female, there are times in their lives where they will exercise um, a more masculine power and a more feminine power. Um, and, and I see that in my own life as well. And I think one experience that I really wanted to share about how I started to understand the nature of power and how my definition of, of power is, is it, you know, has changed um, is that when I spend a long time in China, um, I, I started to notice actually that a lot of um, my clients at the time were very powerful women. Um, and this was a huge change from when I was actually in, in, um, in Europe where most of my clients were, were generally very powerful men. <laughs> um, and um, I, I noticed you know, the, the style of the negotiations, the, the, you know, the tone in the room, we were often doing sort of uh, cross country sort of uh, negotiations on, on the Belt and Road. Um, and, 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 and I had never seen women, you know, in, in that light before. I simply had never been exposed to it. Um, they were softer. They never raised their voices, but they were probably some of the best negotiators I've seen in the world. They got everything they wanted almost all of the time. Um, and I, and, and, and I think there's this term which comes to mind, you know, when I think about, um, the kind of power that I admire, uh, it's a Chinese proverb, um, which says, which means, in tenderness lies steel. And it's something which has really inspired me and, um, and something that I, I, I continue to, to, to remember um, as I, I learn about becoming more authentic and exercising my own power. So, so, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to add, Jo. Yeah, thank you, uh, Virginia, for that lovely Chinese proverb, Rou Zhong Zai Gang. Um, it actually decodes what women power could stand for, that in the strength there is uh, in, the, in the softness, there is strength. Um, I like the way you observe that masculine power is, uh, masculine forms of power is expressed in certain conditions like uh, business um, discussions. And other times, feminine power is also um, needed um, in discussions. Um, I like the fact that you also mentioned that uh, being powerful is also being authentic. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon Xian. She had to discuss your concept of power. Oh gosh, I don't know. I think it's a tough act to follow all these guys. I mean, I think I think power is getting things done, right? Yes. And yes. so, I think maybe one aspect of power that we haven't talked about yet is, you know, we've talked a lot about power as in something within. I think there's also notions of structural power, mm. um, and I think historically women have been shut out. Um, or disadvantaged by certain power structures um, mm. and they may have imposter syndrome they may think like why am I not good enough stuff like that but actually there are structural forces working against them and I think it's I think incumbent upon us who have a lot of privilege to dismantle some of these structural privileges and to enable other people to to have similar amounts of power and I think the reality of the situation is that if you have power you don't actually give it up very willingly so if you're in the majority of anything um, I think it's hard for you to be like, oh yeah, I should give up power to other people in the minority. You're, you enjoy being in power. Um, and so something to think about, but lots more to discuss with the panel. So I won't get us sidetracked over here. Um, yeah, Xian, in my discussion with you, you mentioned something about positional and cultural power. Would you like to elaborate on that? Totally. I mean, I think your boss has positional power over you. You may feel uncomfortable 
uh, disagreeing with him or her, um, even if you have more data. Um, I think cultural power, I think in any place where you feel like the other, where you're not of a majority, you may feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, there's very, I mean, I lived in the US for a long time and I was often the only woman on, on the investment team. Mm -hmm. And the investment team meets on Monday yeah. to talk about deals and they talk mm -hmm. about football. Oh. And I didn't know anything about American football. Oh. It was a totally foreign sport to me. Uh, but I learned about football in order to fit in so that I could have conversation before the partner meeting. Um, and you may say like, hey, that's just trying to get along. But I think that's a good one example of a lot of things where you don't necessarily realize that when you're in the majority of the culture for people, you can actually alienate people. Yeah. Um, if we change the situation from, hey, we were chatting about deals, just talking about what happened, you know, highlights on Sunday night to like, oh, we were chatting about deals in a strip club. I think that would be a really different framing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think cultural, you know, cultural power, like majority power, things like that, I think they actually contribute a lot to differences and how people feel empowered to act in certain uh, organizations and situations. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. And you also mentioned that women are expected to be competent and warm. Uh, yeah, do you disagree? I think. Um, <laughs> Whereas uh, men, you know, men can be cold and competent at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a traditional thing, right? People expect you to be like their mom. Who's the office manager in an office? It's generally a woman. Who's the person taking notes? It's generally a woman. Those are the expectations of women. And when you ask women to do such things that they don't want to, you think, oh, well, that's not very cooperative. That's not very team-like, but we don't ask men to do the same things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that speaks to kind of the expectation of what it is. So people, if a woman is competent and cold, she's described as a bitch. And so if she's incompetent and warm, somehow that's somehow better. Mm -hmm. You know, they fill that sort of idea of, of a more, uh, 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 what do you call, caring presence. Mm. Um, so it's, there's a lot of research about it, but that's the, and I think that goes a little bit to what Shalini was saying earlier about like, what are the ways that you find to be effective in different situations? Yeah. If you can't be, you know, competent and cold, you have to be competent and warm. You have to influence from the side, from the back, you gotta do all these sorts of things. Um, and I think that's just women coping with the situations they're faced with. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like to bring I, I like to bring our attention to Thai. Thai, um, can you share with us? Uh, you know, some of the people who are around you, um, you know, who you experience, who, who you have encountered, and um, and who are powerful. Well, two examples off the top of my head have to include Dr. Yo Sanam and Miss Esther Ong. Dr. Yo Sanam is a pain specialist. Who, have, who has impacted my mother and I uh, greatly because a while ago she had an injury. And, well, it would be, she has uh, a back injury. And it would be, it would have been much, much worse without Dr. Yo's help. Mm. This, oh. well, this, this what inspires me and, well, influences me. Because I feel like he is a doctor who really tries his best for his patients and actually cares about them, mm. and won't won't stop until they they feel some sort of improvement. Miss mm. Esther Ng is a art a art therapist, and she is the founder of Capsi, which I volunteer at. Uh, she when I when I first met her, she I already saw that she had a big heart. And she started talk, talking about me about capsi and bullying. Mm. And then that one, I wanted to, I, I truly saw what was happening, what was happening in this world. And then I really wanted to help because stuff like bullying and things are really not right. And I would like to do my part to try to stop that. Because mm. I, I think power is about changing and influencing people. Mm. So this people with power truly I, I really think that they they have improved me in one way or another mm. Mm. that sounds so inspiring and you inspire us also 
um, with your involvement with the coalition against bullying um, children and youth that you are willing to at this age uh, volunteer at CAPC inspires us and that is your power Kai. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And powerful people are also kind people and I'm glad that you've met them. You've also met um, powerful people in your school. Would you like to share that with us? Well, the powerful people in my school, I would have to go down to one of my teachers. Because you know how like if a teacher comes in class, like the students, sometimes they don't care and then they just they just like continue talking to each other, don't do greetings. Mm. But some my my teacher had uh <clears throat> I believe has gotten my peers respect my respect. Mm. Because what happens is that we when he comes into the classroom, we automatically like quiet down, settle down do greetings and I think that is inspiring because he sees us as an equal and mm. can joke around with us just like we're his, we're his friends or something mm. so if I was ever a teacher I hope that my students would respect me and I could respect them like that as well mm. yeah aren't you blessed to have a very good teacher who inspires respect and inspire you to be one of um one of them, to inspire to be like them. Um, you also mentioned um, a prefect that you met. Uh, yeah, he's one of my friends. Um, you know how pre sometimes prefects get the image that they are just about the, the school rules. They, they book anybody who like just slightly disobeys. This prefect is, uh, well, he sees others like himself he also sees other peers like an ego mm. and he well he likes he lets things go when he knows that sometimes we do these things and that's perfectly okay mm. like sometimes we can make mistakes sometimes we can do something and as long i think if he knows that we regret it and we know what we did wrong he allows us to he allows us to learn our lesson and doesn't have to do anything big does have to book us, does have to uh, scold us. Mm. I believe that's inspiring because he knows that he understands us and we can appreciate that and we can move on in life without having to get a, a detention or something. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like um, people who are powerful know when to um, exert their power and uh, when to encourage so that in, in their correct implementation of power, they inspire you to become better. Thank you so much uh, for sharing, Kai, uh, from your experience with um, powerful people. Um, in the exercise of power, uh, especially among women, um, there could be some challenges and barriers, um, you know, um, like uh, Minister Anne mentioned. Um, Shah, um, do you experience any challenges to expressing your power as the commander of the military institute, for example, or in your career, because you are in a primarily uh, male dominated and Shami, I just say that you look amazing in your sari. And even thank you, sari, it's uh, also in the RJS theme of green, black, and white. <laughs> yeah, I noticed and able to you know inspire and you know command your men this way as well. Yeah, thank you. Great. Yes, uh, yeah, I'd actually like to take up that question as well as some of the questions in the chat yes. about about um, you know being in a minority and how that affects the perception of uh, lack of power or powerlessness and and I, I think I can I can relate to that um, for example okay you know like going up the hierarchy right the higher up you go the, the fewer women you see and especially the fewer working mothers you see and uh, among your peers uh, you know uh, you will have you know, generally males whose wives have taken on a very uh, you know, sort of a balancing role. They've either given up their work or they work part-time, you know, and their uh, children are all sorted. And, and, and I think that, you know, that actually contributes to uh, the, the reason why women sort of drop out. You know, when we come out of schools like RGS, we are like, you know, ahead of the boys or, or on par with the boys and we are like all ready to go, you know, to be daughters of a better age and change the world. But then after a while, you, you look around and, and you're like, what happened to everyone? You know, and, and, yeah. and I think that uh, a lot of it is um, maybe 
uh, self, uh, sort of holding ourselves back, you know, self-censorship as well, because women, you know, we, we feel somehow the need to have to, to balance our own needs, our own career, our own aspirations with um, our family, our, our children, you know, growing up well, getting the best PSLE scores, getting to the best schools and, and uh, having enough time for them and, and uh, um, need, needing to uh, feel liked and, and uh, you know, sort of please everybody in the room, right? And whether it's your family and, and everything as well. So, and I think that that um, contributes a bit to, to people dropping out and, and, and feeling that, uh, well, if there's no one else here who's a working mom, I don't know what makes me think I can do it. You know, I, 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 something must be so difficult about this job that, that there aren't women doing it, right? So, so I think that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, we kind of lose steam and, 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 and uh, take a back seat. You know? and, and I've done that myself. You know, I've, I've had uh, made decisions in my career. I've actually told my bosses that I don't think this is the right time for me to move up and move ahead. And I think I, I cannot commit to a long-term, you know, a sort of a plan because I don't know how my kids will turn out, whether my parents will be able to take care of them and things like that. So that's been my personal uh, struggle as well. And it, it took me much longer to get to where um, one of my male, male colleagues would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken the same in much more time than my male colleagues would have taken. And I think that uh, what we can do um, is to um, be that be the role model or be that, that the other example in the room, you know, so that people coming after us can say, hey, look, you know, she's done it, you know, uh, and I think maybe she's done it and I can do it too. And, and that's not just for working moms, but any minority, you know, whether it's minority or race, you know, being female or whether you have, you know, uh, uh, you know disabilities as well. I think uh, you just have to be that first, you know, person and, and then be that, that inspiration and that example that, that others can, can then follow it and gives them confidence. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sha. I, I like I like your um, idea that we must, as women, we can be the first in the room to help other women. And also, um, one of the barriers in 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 a progression of career could be um, ourselves taking a back seat um, for our family. But sometimes, perhaps also, it could be the internal script that we play to ourselves that we may not be as capable. Um, I'd like to ask, um, actually, uh, Joe, can I just jump in at this point? And oh, I yes, think, Georgia, yeah, okay. I think, yeah. I think we're actually moving away very in a segue in really nicely into this topic of not just power and power within ourselves, but how we empower others. Mm. Right. I think that actually is an extension and it goes to answer some of the, the, the points that are being raised in the chat too. Mm. Um, it's about acceptance, but, but more than mm. that, how do we empower, how do we, you know, help, um, you know, how do we counsel, how do we mentor, how do we sponsor along the way mm. And mm. at the right time, how do we get out of the way so mm. that we can make way for others so that they can, as they get on this pathway of, of, of progress and prosperity and everything else on success, how do they, how do we help them succeed? I think that's empowerment. That, that is very powerful mm -hmm. in itself, but it's also empowering. And I think mm -hmm. we, that that's something that we need to talk about even more mm -hmm. so. Yes, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. Um, in the examination of um, the challenges that we face, we definitely would like to um, consider how we can be a part of the solution, right? So I, also, I, I would like to continue with uh, some of the challenges women feel or experience, right, uh, in the expression of power. Um, Virginia, you also work in a highly male-dominated uh, environment at times when you're in China. Um, how did you um, overcome that? Or what are some of the barriers you face as a um, single woman in China, a young woman in China? Um, I mean, it's not just about China, right? I mean, I'm in the most male-dominated industry I've ever been in right now, in, <laughs> yes, in, 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 in venture capital. Yes. Um, it, you know, it, it's, 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 it's actually really um, interesting. Um, I, I've never, I think until I, I moved into venture capital, I actually never really thought um, about uh, male female dynamics that much. Um, I felt that uh, in the Western environment where I worked in for ten years, um, yes, very male dominated. But it, but uh, you know, I, I I felt as a professional, you know, the opportunities to rise uh, were still uh, plentiful. Mm. 
when I moved to China, in many ways, um, you know, I think it was, it was it was the first time I was really exposed to really, really powerful women. And I mean, women who were leading listed companies, uh, billionaires who had built real estate empires, um, but also at the same time had happy marriages, you know, had had children. It, it was, you know, I, I really love what Juhok said in the beginning about how powerful women in Singapore or, or in this region were often viewed as caricatures of their male um, uh, counterparts. I, I thought that was a really, really powerful thing actually to say. Um, and for the first time in my life, I, I was being exposed to actually quite the opposite. <laughs> you know, I, I was, uh, and, and, and again, it was also again, the, the sort of the semi-Western stereotype of the stay-at-home husband, um, you know, with a powerful wife. Well, what I was seeing was, uh, you know, a lot of these power couples in China, they build their empires together, or one was a CEO of a listed company, the other one was a CTO of, an, of another listed company. You know, it was, it was really, um, really eye-opening for me. Um, today, you know, um, how, do I, how do I overcome um, that? Um, actually, I don't spend so much time uh, really thinking about um, power dynamics in venture capital, I'm aware that they exist. Um, I don't think it really affects um, uh, the way I operate per se as an investor or, or, or when I lead an investment. However, what what coming into the venture capital world has very cl uh, clearly showed me is actually for the first time in my life, actually the huge disparity um, and the, the real lack of, of, of equality when it comes to the way I think entrepreneurs are actually evaluated. Um, and I think I, I think in some ways it is a shock to the system. You know, having having really felt that the, the playing field was was actually quite equal, and then actually realizing that that it's not um, in 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 every way. And so I think that you know what gives me so much purpose in the work that I do today is ensuring that more female uh, more female entrepreneurs get funded. We invest in both male and female entrepreneurs at Teja. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to notice that um, sometimes, you know, for example, female entrepreneurs maybe have more difficulty getting lead, uh, you know, getting a lead investor. And so the role of, of us as a venture capitalist perhaps is to back them and ensure that we build syndicates who back them. And that's what gives, you know, a lot of meaning to my work, apart from, you know, just finding really, really good companies, you know, exciting technology, um, um, you know, and, 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 and I think sometimes, um, you know, the best way I, I think to deal with understanding this, this, these inequalities is to, uh, I think something you said before, you know, is really to try and open, open the door for, 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 for other women and, and, and other men. It's, 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 uh, you, you know, an entire industry is not going to change for you overnight. I don't lose a lot of sleep, uh, you know, on it, despite, despite the fact that, you know, we built, she loves tech. Um, despite the fact that, that, that I think I, I, I see in practice, how a lot of a lot of these inequalities play out and how they lead to a lot of unequal outcomes. So, for example, something that I see a lot is that some of the best companies, you know, um, you know, uh, in the market are not necessarily, you know, raising the most money or not necessarily being funded adequately. Um, and, and the ones which are being funded are because of closed networks. And I think, yeah, I think that gives me even greater motivation to sort of try to balance out the playing field and, 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 and open the doors for, for, for others, in particular other women. So, um, yeah, that's my view towards it. Thank you, Virginia. It's really interesting that when you experience barriers, when you ex experience blockages and find way, and then you find ways to surmount them, then it makes you more aware of the existence of these barriers and wants to do more to break down those barriers. And that is powerful. You know, Virginia, that's, that's really powerful. I, it causes you to want to open doors for other people because of the barriers that you feel. Um, I, yeah, so is, this could be cultural barriers, it could be social barriers, this could be industry barriers, so to speak. Yeah. I, I think this is particularly important, especially for, um, I think being an RGS girl. Mm. Um, I, think, I think we're very aware of, of, of the privilege of, of having even been to this school. I've always seen um, RGS girls as some of the best educated women in Asia, if not the world. And I think, you know, the question for me is how we really use that privilege mm -hmm. um, to really open the way for others. You know, I mean, I mean, that's one reason why I think this conference and this alumni association, you know, can do a lot more because collectively, actually power can be even greater. Mm, yeah. You know, with um, the privilege comes a lot of responsibility and accountability. And I'm glad, Virginia, that you are making yourself um, very accountable 
to the school that has um, brought us to where we are. And um, that's why we need to serve the community because of what we have. Um, I'd like to um, go to um, Ju Hog and ask you, what do you think are some of the barriers that women face um, in, in exercising their power? Hey, um, <clears throat> and I, actually, I was actually going to add on to what Virginia was saying because you know we are in the same field, right? You know, uh, mm. Yes, I know VC has always been a male-dominated industry, and that's because of history, right? And it's mm. also an industry that's a lot of alpha male, you know, is me, 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 right? You know, kind of thing. Right? And and but increasingly, we are seeing a lot of uh, 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 more women coming in into this space. And you know, uh, and just for for my team itself, you know, almost half of my team are, fe are female. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, we when we recruit, we don't look at say, hey, I need to fulfill certain criteria. I need to fulfill the uh, gender, you know, kind of thing. I look at a, you know, who is the best that can can you know solve help me solve the problem, right? You know, so mm -hmm. so to me, I think that's maybe I I come from a different angle. You know, I don't see that as really so much of an issue, right? Um, I mean, coming back to your questions, I think, you know, the, yes, obviously, you know, uh, I think from my perspective, um, as a leader, you know, I always open up uh, the doors, you know, whether it's male or female, you know, and, and give them opportunities, uh, speak up, give them feedback, you know, uh, encourage them, uh, empower them, you know, uh, whether it's male or female, right? You know, so to me, I think that's probably not so much of an issue. Uh, and women, I obviously, you know, sometimes they face in 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 workplaces, and I'm not sure. Sometimes it's more self-imposed. You know, there are toxic. Uh, I saw a question there. You know, there's a bit of a toxic mas masculine masculinity yes you know there are you know but there's always a choice right you know if you don't stand up for yourself if you don't speak up and you feel that this doesn't still doesn't work there's always an alternative look for another organization that you know maybe you know, treat people better right mm -hmm. yeah thank you for taking on that question in the uh, chat room about uh, toxic masculine uh, masculinity um i think men in general are non-toxic um, and they are really, really nice um, to have around. Um, and we, and at this point in time, I just want to pause and thank you to all, the, thank all the men who are courageous, confident, and caring enough to be part of us, um, to have this discussion, and brave enough also to be in the midst of so many powerful women. <laughs> um, I would like uh, to kind of move away from my my panel a little bit and ask a minister. Xiao Huang, you're working in a very male-dominated, or you use the word in a male-dominated um, <laughs> industry, so to speak, environment, so to speak. Did you experience any challenge to your authority? And what did you do? Well, uh, George, uh, thanks, thanks for that question. Yes, I was in the SEF for more than 20 years. You're the um, first Brigadier General. Uh, yes, I... I Yes, I um, became a brigadier general in 2015 wow. um, after more than 20 years in the SAF. And, and like uh, Dr. Shalini said, um, it is a male-dominated environment. Mm. Um, but um, I've learned to um, you know, find my own way and chart my path as a leader in the SAF. You see, what I realized is that um, in a male-dominated environment, at least for myself, um, for me to um, do well, actually, it's not about, uh, you know, pretending to be like a man, you know, to act like one, to blend in, uh, but instead it's about complementing the team and uh, being able to bring value to the team. Mm. Now, um, I um, was in the Air Force, trained as an air traffic controller, mm. and air traffic controllers work in teams. And to be a good air traffic controller, you need to be good in your individual skill, um, mm. understanding the equipment, rules of the air, um, the, the rules of the business, how to um, uh, bring aircraft, uh, direct aircraft safely from the air base out to the training areas and back and so on. And uh, that requires a lot of uh, professional knowledge and skills. And that was what 
I think I uh, developed. You know, I, I realized that to get respect and also to be able to bring value to the team, it's important to uh, be competent. You know, this uh, word came up just now a few times, to be competent, to be good actually at what I, you know, uh, am trained to do. Mm. So I actually invested a lot of time, you know, learning from uh, other uh, uh, seniors and also um, uh, spending a lot of time to improve my own skills. Mm. So that's one part about, you know, uh, uh, being professional, uh, to be able to uh, get the respect and be able to bring value to the team. The other thing that I um, also believe very strongly in is um, purpose. Purpose, mm -hmm. you know, um, I tell that to myself, I tell that to my team all the time. You know, it's not about me, it's not about you. Um, it's about our purpose, our mission, you know. So uh, uh, it's important that we uh, have common uh, belief in uh, the job that has to be done and have a have a, 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 a common respect for one another and make sure that we support uh, one another in order to achieve the mission of the day. So uh, yes, you know, working in a male-dominated environment, sometimes um, I do feel uh, a little uh, like the odd one out, but you know, I always remind myself, you know, be professional, number one. Um, and number two, um, be clear about the purpose. It's not about me. It's about the team. It's about us. It's about getting the job done. So, you know, that's my quick response to George's questions. Thanks. Thank you, Xiao Huang. Um, don't mean to surprise you, but uh, thank you for, you know, uh, being so succinct uh, in sharing um, how one can overcome um, perhaps some, some challenges, you know, working in a male-dominated uh, environment. Uh, one has to prove yourself, you know, uh, by being very professional by being confident and showing your purpose, knowing your mission, and um, being very supportive of, um, you know, um, of the team and vice versa. Um, I would like to switch to the other minister, senior minister, and um, you also work in a male-dominated environment. Um, do you have any, um, you know, how, how, do, how do you work around, you know, working with so many um, good gentlemen? Well, I think um, it's true to say that both Xiao Huang and I were now, uh, you know, in still in a quite male dominated environment um, in in politics as well as grassroots activism, mm -hmm. um, because we work with many volunteers. The way in which I think we we handle the fact that you know there's a there's a working culture that's very much. Um, shaped by the fact that more men entered it earlier than women, mm -hmm. uh, it's different than the workplace. In the workplace, you can make rules. And you know, we, we increasingly will have more and more laws that mm -hmm. support uh, anti-discrimination. Uh, you know, that's very important work that Xiao Huang's ministry yeah. uh, MOM is working on. But I think when you're working with many volunteers, um, it's a different context because people need to feel motivated and they want to feel part of a team mm -hmm. and uh you know it's 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 things that we don't get paid to do volunteers don't get paid to do uh, uh many of the amazing things that they do so culture uh in these contexts i think become even more important mm -hmm. and i think if you're a woman leader uh it you have to make some hard choices right from the beginning and there are no easy answers. I'll just give a very simple example. Um, in the Singapore sort of community volunteerism context, um, there is this fondness for bonding over supper. For instance, right, we, we serve our residents uh, and very often until quite late at night, whether it's meet the people sessions or door-to-door -door visits. And volunteers would, you know, very often like to bond with one another. Uh, as, as well as with the, you know, MP or grassroots advisor, uh, after the work is done over supper, the supper culture is quite important. But I, I noticed this when I was a volunteer myself, and very often I declined invitations to go to supper because I was a working mom. Mm. I, I was volunteering, but num A, I have to get to work the next day, mm. and B, you know, I'm trying to get home before my kids go to sleep. You know, and I, and, I, and I do want to put them to bed if I can. You know, I don't want to go a whole day without seeing 
without seeing them. Mm-hmm. And and I notice most of the men, uh, most of the people who go to supper are men. They don't have to worry about putting the kids to bed, you know. And many of them are also, you know, either business people. They run their own hours, you know. They're not employees, you know. Or some of them are retired, so timing is very flexible. But we have a culture that was shaped by a certain demographic based on their hours, based on their preferences. And when you don't belong to those to that demographic, you, you are going to have some difficulty fitting in. So Shiyan's point also resonated with me about Monday, Monday night football. You know, yeah, that's going to be very, very challenging for someone like me. I don't even get the offside rule in soccer right, you know, uh, not to mention American football. So I think that, um, so that, that was actually one of the things I had to decide. You know, it sounds very trivial, but looking back, I don't think it was. And mm. when, when, I, when I led my own team in my constituency, I decided I don't sup. No supper. Because I, I love have... this. It's awesome. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank, you. you <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was hard. It was hard because I knew that there were people who wondered why does this, this person not lead us in those late night suppers, you know? But I decided, look, I start now. I have to do this forever and I don't actually enjoy it because I'm I still have children <laughs> you know and 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 this is this is not what plus um I mean some women will agree with me yeah huh? you know moment on the lips lifetime on the hips huh? yeah okay we don't have as high metabolism as the men so <laughs> I don't want to have to work harder you know for that late night porridge so so it's a choice it's a choice but I I I find other ways to bond with my volunteers. And also over time, you know, we bring in people with more diverse demographics and we find that, you know, we, we have activities, for instance, that are family friendly on the weekends where our children can join us, for instance, where our, where our partners can join us. Um, and I think that uh, you have to make it, some of these hard decisions. And yes, not everyone will agree. Uh, that's inevitable, but... Mm-hmm. You know, eventually, I think people will understand, and I, and I think that's that's um, just part and parcel. I think of the changes that we go through, as both workplaces as well as volunteer contexts become more inclusive. I, I'm sorry to those who love supper. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Anne. Um, I I love your sharing, like about making hard choices. I think powerful power, Therein lies the power, right? to make choices. And if the choices lies with the family, uh, if the first choice is the family, I think that's a very powerful choice. And uh, women are powerful to the extent that um, they choose that. Um, men are powerful in their own rights, but I think the ability to take a step back is itself a power. Um, Joe, I'm, I'm gonna challenge you here. Hey, hey, hey please do you. that. Please do that. Sorry, sorry. So why is it that women have to make the, the, the shift for family? Why can't, aren't, aren't men contributing to their children as well? You know, mm. Mm. Wh- why don't... That's a, that's a question that we should ask men. Um, not saying that we have to make those, uh, those uh, uh, step backs. Definitely not. You can see... No, sharp. no, no. I think, I think we should. Yeah. I, I think like family is really important, but I think... Yeah why is it that women have to bear the burden of making the cultural changes? Mm. Why is society's expectation that men don't have to make those changes? So, you know, like, say man was like, well, I want to be home to see my kids before they go to bed. I mean, the kids might want to see their dad too before they go to bed. They so, so we don't have that expectation. We don't have that expectation on them, Yes. you know? And, and yes. so that's kind of like, I yes. just kind of want to push this, which is, I think there's a little bit of an undercurrent for this conversation, which is like, hey, how do we make the best of the situation we've been dealt as women who historically mm. have been less powerful? Mm. But I want to challenge us to, to answer the question of like, how do we make the system better for everyone? Mm. Um, not just like do the best we can. And, and mm. I love this supper example mm. uh, because it's a small but powerful sort of signaling about, hey, mm. we still want to bond, yeah. but we want to bond in a way that more people can participate. Mm. And I would say like, my wife works for GIC GIC has a family day instead of a Christmas party. And I actually think that's great because family mm. day is during the day. Mm. Family is a very encompassing term. So you can see older employees bring kids to family day. Mm. Younger employees bring their parents to family day. Mm. Yeah, And that actually is better than a Christmas party because you might not want to go out and 
see your colleagues be sloppy drunk at night. Yeah. That's actually yeah. not that fun. No. Um, and so, so I, I would love to just like push us in this conversation a little bit as, as RGS girls um, and, and male allies, Shu Hog and Tai, you know, how do we think about making the system work better regardless of what the historical or choices might have been mm. um, to account for the fact that, you know, there is a much more diverse workforce. Mm. Most people, you know, like I, most, most women do not have the privilege of stay at home spouses. Mm. Mm. And so that creates a very different starting point for the types of choices that they're making. Yes. Um, and, and that, that is a, that is a, that is male privilege in and of itself, right? Like mm. that you, you, you might imagine a world where you have a stay at home life. Yeah. Um, and, and I have a wife, but she would never stay at home. Mm. So, you know, I can't imagine that world. Yeah. Um, so, so I just want to kind of like, you know, sure. put, put those yeah. thoughts out there. Sure. I totally agree with you. I think this calls for change in mindset, right? And women navigate, circumnavigate around the need to be at home, right? By, by making a choice. And so the choice is a very personal one and it calls for change in mindset. You know, the male spouse may decide to take a back seat and say, hey, I'm looking, I'll, I'll step back and look after my children, even though I may be the bigger, you know, um, salary uh, earner, right? That is a personal choice and it calls for mindset change more than anything else. Yeah. And, right. and, and Jock, Jock yeah. maybe can I just add one more thing? Of um, course, of course. Because, because the other thing that I noticed, right, um, especially since I was talking about, you know, um, uh, couples where, where, you know, that there's, you know, both are, are powerful, right, you know, versus yeah. one or the other are, are, are powerful. One of the other things I also noticed is that this generation of men, as in our generation of men, they're changing too. Mm. So in, in the course of my career, and I think this has probably impacted me a lot, in the early course of my career, I worked literally only for men. All my bosses were men. Mm. But I learned quite a lot of things from them as well. Um, mm. They were not definitely not going out for suppers. Mm. I don't know whether it's just a coincidence or I chose that. But all the men I worked for were actually incredibly family orientated. Mm. And, so, and so therefore, you know, they, you know, my, I had a boss in England and he left mm. every day, hooker by crook mm. at 7.30 because he was going to get home yeah. um, and, and, and he, he always timed it. Like I knew exactly yeah. when he was going to leave. Yeah. And because yeah. he, he, he prioritized his young children, he would, right. he would take leave to watch his young kids play, um, you know, his young kids, you know, do a school play. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and the thing is that I had five bosses like that. And they, they were all guys actually. And, mm. and, and, and I watched them. So actually I think when Shien talks about making the system better for all of us, you know, a lot of these, um, and I watch a lot of my friends now becoming dads. Mm. And, and I noticed they also want to get home in time right. um, yeah. so that they can, they can hang out with their little kids. You know, I put mm. them to bed and, and change their diapers, which, which is very funny for me to watch, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think the whole system can change because of that. You know, it shouldn't be that we expect men to go out to supper and women to yeah. skip supper, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, and, absolutely. you know, and, and, and I think I, I, I want to give a shout out to that because yes. um, it's not just about women changing. We mm -hmm. need to acknowledge the fact that men are changing too. And this, yeah. this is good for everybody. Absolutely. And, and the change starts with us. Like um, someone says, Elise, you know, says the change starts with us, right? We, you know, sometimes when I see a, ma a dad, the only dad in the kindergarten, right? And then all the rest are all moms. And I go like, what is this dad doing? You know, hasn't he got a job, right? But that is, a, I'm guilty of that. And I realize he's taking a step back or he decides that my kids are very important. I want to support my wife. And to him, I raise a toast, right? So, so um, let me jump I, in uh, here, Joe. Oh. Let me jump, yeah. jump in here. Okay. Look, I think this is I think getting a really interesting conversation point Absolutely. here. Yeah. Um, it is about choice. Absolutely, it's about choice. But I think the choice starts with us because yep. we have to encourage the men in our lives yeah. to be stepping up. We have to actually give them the opportunity to step up. We mm. can't just take it on ourselves to, to do it and just say, hey, no, we're going to do it and it's, and it's efficient, so we'll get it covered. We yeah. actually have to give these men yeah. the opportunity to do these things. So whether it's be listed in the school as the emergency contact, I mean, seriously, ladies on, um, on in, the, in the chat room here, how many of you are listed as the emergency yeah. contact? I yeah. bet you most of you are. Yeah. How many of the fathers are listed yeah. as the emergency contact? Not yeah. so many, maybe, yes. right? Yes. So 
it starts with the little things. It starts with going to supper. It starts with changing the diapers. It starts with being at home and making sure that you're the one to, that gives the kids the bath or whatever and, and taking the kids to school. It starts in a little ways, but we have to give those men the opportunities because then, then and only then can they change along the way too. Then and only then can they understand what women do. Um, this unpaid work component, the second, third jobs that they all take, um, you know, particularly during this trying time. And I think this is where the role of mothers becomes really important. Mm. I mm. happen to have two daughters, but I'm very, very um, keen that women encourage their sons to learn and teach mm. them to be good role models, to learn to, to respect women, value the, what women do in the, in the community, the role that they play, not just in the family or schools or workplace, but actually in the community. So that's actually a really um, uh, important piece that women can actually teach their kids, mm -hmm. their sons to yes. also you know, uh, be, be good men later on. And that's a role that we all have to play in life too. Yes, I, I totally agree. And, and that's why I like your initiative that you're going to start. It's called Boys Empowered. And I think that's a fantastic initiative to get young men and even older, uh, yes. older gentlemen to young, think young about women, the ideas. Yes. <laughs> young and younger Absolute, men. To that's think right. About, you know, and um, yeah, to, to think about empowering uh, women uh, by the way they uh, reach out to them, by the way they, um, they, they embrace them. And to that end, I really like what Joe Hawk says that he actually looks into recruitment, recruiting more, uh, more women, and also you know removing the barriers for the entries, and um, that's really to be applauded. Um, that kind of uh, changes is definitely what um, what we need, and it takes both hands to clap, right? For men to reach out to us, and for women to also reach out to them. So, right? so Joe, let me let me just. The, the live yeah. example is right in front of us, Ty. Yes. Yes. Ty is right there, yes. okay? He is a young man who's yes. going to make a huge difference. Absolutely. And full credit to him yes. and his understanding of it. But you know what? A big shout out to his mom, okay? Yes. A big okay. shout out to his mom for teaching her son right. Mm, mm. And um, yeah. great job, Belinda, there. Okay, I want to go Could I join in this conversation for a second? <laughs> yes, I want to bring Ty in now because, and that's really perfect. Ty, can I just ask you a question, right? Yeah. Why do you think some women cannot express power? Uh, I believe they could be oppressed by people like above them, like their bosses and things like that. Because mm. I believe that some people feel that they need to push people down in order to stay on top. Mm. I don't believe that that's the way to to uh, manage your employees or people like that because I believe you should be pushing them up with you as well. Absolutely. They're all in the same boat. Mm. Mm. But right. if I could add on to the conversation a bit earlier, mm. uh, I, I agree with Virginia and I agree with Georgette because uh, they said that it's about men that are changing in this day and age and it's also about giving men choices because like uh, not too long ago, we, we couldn't believe that there could be a stay-at-home husband and a working mother, but now it doesn't seem so rare. Mm. And I believe that we're truly, we, can, we truly can move in the right direction if we want to. Mm. It's about improving ourselves day, from one day to another. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's an excellent point, right? Um, and, and, and this gentle evolution of um, roles and how society perceives male and female role it's going to be very empowering both for men and women. And I'm glad that we're here to be able to decode um, that kind of power. Uh, we have a few more minutes left, which I will borrow also from session three later on. So I'm going to shoot, overshoot this a bit. And this is about igniting the power within. Um, Shah, could you share with us how you think we can ignite the power within us? Yeah, thanks. So yeah, like what has been, has been said all this while, you know, um, I, have, I have two sons. And I think it's important, uh, you know, for them to, to realize, you know, that, that uh, their mom works as hard as their dad, sometimes, you know, longer hours, and that, uh, and that they can call either their mom or their dad. It doesn't always have to be the mom, you know, if they have a, a crisis, whether it's in school or at home. And I think that uh, eventually, you know, teachers will also get it. Like, you know, you don't have to call the mom all the time. Like, like what Jojen mentioned about emergency contact, right? And, and then I think that um, we ourselves, you know, we need to, 
just relax a little bit. You know, we have to mm. realize that um, you don't have to do everything excellently. You know, you can you can, you have your four you have your several burners, right? You've got your kids, your your husband, your your work, and your your personal time, and that you really have to uh, let yourself you know uh, some time to have a balance between the four burners. Focus on one thing, you know, that when you're at home, focus on your kids. And then when you're at work, let yourself focus on work and, and not have to uh, worry about everything else and make sure that you take some time for your personal growth, you know, do something that you're passionate about, whether it's studying something new or, or volunteering. And, and I think that um, uh, that would give us a little bit of, of mind space, you know, yes. to, to uh, feel less um, like we have to please everyone all the time and you have to do it well in everything all the time. Mm. Yeah, that's what I yeah. feel. That's fantastic. I love your, 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 you know, your quote, focus on one burner at a time. We all have so many burners, right? And to focus on one burner at a time really makes a lot of sense. And also do things that interest us to increase our, uh, you know, our bandwidth of, of joy. Um, I want to ask um, Cheyenne, Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne, sorry. Cheyenne, how do you develop habits that can build power? Are you there, Cheyenne? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, great, great. How do you develop? You mentioned something about self-awareness when we, we had our interviews. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talked earlier about the definition of power as the ability to get things done. Mm. And I think that believing that you can get things done is buttressed by the fact that you've gotten things done in the past. That's right. And so you start small. Mm. Uh, you're not trying to change the system overnight. Mm. You might be just trying to do one small change at a time. Mm. And as you experience success with these small steps, you then develop the confidence to make bigger and bigger changes. Mm. So I think that's one aspect of building habits around power. Mm. I think the other aspect of building habits around power is a lot of what stops you is worrying about what other people think. Mm. What happens if you fail? Mm. What happens if other people think you're crazy mm. <laughs> different mm. and uh a lot of making change mm. is just not caring so much about that and having confidence in your own determination that something should be done it's the right thing to do yeah, yeah. um and so i think that's where power comes from is the ability to listen to your inner voice and not mm. those treacherous outside voices oh, and then right. building a track record of success mm. and even if you fail not being bowled over by it and feeling that you can go and try again mm. Mm. yeah that's great thank you um do you help may i ask yeah, you yeah, yeah um, sorry yeah <clears throat> i was good <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I was going to jump in, you know, I fully agree, right? You know, you don't need to live a life, you know, based on what others think or what other wants you to, to do, right? Yeah. And which is very important because, you know, I think the real power is about uh, presence, right? You know, it's mm. it's the, the, the energy of knowing that you are who you are and therefore speaking and acting from your authentic self, right? And, and you know, asking questions like, you know, what would it take for you to feel proud for the effect you have on others? Uh, are you afraid that people will negatively charge, judge you? Will you lose your friends if you stand proudly in your power? You might lose friends who are envious of you, but mm -hmm. then gain those who love and show, uh, love you for, for your show of com uh, confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I, I love that, you know, presence, you know, knowing who you are and, you know, what makes you feel proud and knowing that, um, that self, um, being aware of, of, of yourself and what you're worth makes, can be a very powerful um, idea, ideology to live by. That, that, that power is um, freedom from fear to express yourself, um, um, to do good. Um, we have run out of time but there are many questions that have come on. Um, we have a session three buffer coming up after panel two. Um, thank you, my wonderful panel of um, speakers. Um, you guys are awesome, amazing. Uh, thank you also, Anne, uh, Minister Anne and um, Minister Xiao Huang um, for chipping in.
um, to this uh, to make this panel um, Wonder Women Decoded uh, a very exciting uh, and enjoyable one. Um, thank you. And uh, right now we're just going to take a short break. During the short break, we will be listening to Violin uh, Mozart Sonata performed by Tang Ti Kun, who is an RGS alum as well. Is this a recording? Um, she's an National Art Council uh, scholar and who had been uh, given the privilege to play the our $500,000 violin for seven years. And you're going to listen to that piece of music right now. So enjoy. Once the music is done, uh, please come back for panel number two. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jog and the panelists for that engaging discussion. Um, and as Jog mentioned, thank you to everyone for your questions and comments. We encourage you to continue raising them, especially from those who don't identify as female. Um, and as Jog mentioned, it's now time to take a break. If the um, break is just over five minutes, and please, we encourage you to be back just after 10.40. Thank you.
everyone and welcome back. Um, again, we had the privilege to hear a rendition from Tang Ti Kun, who has been described as a chamber musician of the highest honor. It's hard to argue against that, huh? Now it's time for our second guest of honor. Jiog, over to you for the introduction. I hope everyone had a good break and at the same time, enjoy the beautiful string music performed by Tang Ti Kun. Um, I take pleasure and honor now to invite our next guest of honor, uh, Minister of State, Ms. Gan Xiao Huang. Gan Xiao Huang is the Senior Minister of State for the Ministries of Education and Manpower. I also have a personal anecdote to share about Minister Xiao Huang. Xiao Wang has used her influence to get our to get the campus, our old campus um, at Anderson Road, which was it is disused now, for use by um, the migrant domestic workers on their day off, which is Sunday. And um, when I found out about it, I was really excited. And when we are just goes found out about it, it, we were very excited because it was red, it's redolent of the time of, of the ethos of the school to actually um, build up girls with skills. So we decided to create a well-being event at the school. And during the well-being event, we had to bring, we had yoga mats that we wanted to give to the foreign domestic workers. They were all in my car. And Xiao Huang Game Li, a minister Xiao Huang Game Li came over to my car and picked up like 10 yoga mats. I mean, she's a commander of the army, she could do that and brought it into the, um, into the theater. I was very touched by that simple act of humility and the care that she has for people. Um, so it is with honor and pleasure that I call upon uh, Minister Gan to share with us her thoughts on power. Minister, over to you. Thank you, Joel. Actually, I'm truly humbled by the great work that the RGS alumni has done. Um, uh, you know, you, I'm so proud, so proud of being a former RGS girl, um, hearing about uh, the impact that our former RGS girls are creating in the world, and also the RGS alumni, you know, under the good leadership of Jock, um, to help uh, disadvantaged women and uh, people who need an uplift out there. So indeed, it is about power, you know, our ability to help others. Um, that I think makes a difference and that, you know, uh, I'm truly, truly humbled by. Now, I uh, wanted to share three messages uh, for the second panel today. Um, I know it is about power. Um, and I thought, um, you know, to share some of my own personal journey uh, to bring out, you know, my own reflections about power. The first is about how um, there are both external and internal barriers for women and that women ourselves, we need to overcome the internal barriers. Um, I'll speak a little about the external barriers. Actually, I think a lot was covered uh, in the first session. Uh, Shaya mentioned um, the structural barriers, how uh, there are environmental and societal um, expectations and norms that uh, perhaps keep out women. I think those are very real. Um, uh, and just reflecting on my own uh, experience in, uh, in the SAF, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier on that I was in the military for more than 20 years. Um, well, it, it is, you know, uh, indeed very daunting, in the beginning at least, you know, uh, to be in a male-dominated uh, workplace. Um, and very often I'm asked, why are there so few uh, women commanders and women leaders in the SAF? Well, I would say that there are, to me, you know, there are three, three reasons. First um, is that uh, the SAF uh, is quite a competitive workplace. You know, it attracts um, the top 10, 20% of each male cohort. Many men actually uh, choose to sign on to become regulars, full-time officers in the SAF um, you know, because of the opportunities and also because they share the purpose of the organization. And um, uh, there are far fewer women 
in uh, who choose this path, perhaps because there are more other choices, and perhaps you know women uh, are less drawn to a military career, and hence you know uh, quite naturally you know women will be outnumbered, and by the time it comes to um, leadership uh, roles and uh, choosing um, people who are suitable, there are less far less women to, to choose from. So, you know, from the outset, um, uh, there's already this numerical disadvantage and hence less women you see uh, in the hierarchy. Um, and uh, another uh, a reason I would attribute it to the nature of the work, well, it's true that uh, there are quite a few vocations in the SAF uh, that provide maybe natural advantage to men. For example, uh, vocations such as divers, gutsmen, combat engineers, you know, uh, jobs that uh, require uh, intense, immense uh, strength and speed. Well, I think it's biologically understandable that uh, men, you know, would have a natural advantage compared to women. Well, I've, you know, uh, seen uh, some women doing very well uh, in, in these vocations, but far fewer compared to men. So I think the nature of the job itself also uh, lends some natural advantage to uh, men uh, in the SAF and hence, you know, uh, uh, you know in relating to my earlier point about competence, being good for the job, um, it's, uh, I think, reasonable to, you know, to, to expect that uh, there'll be uh, more men who do better in some of these vocations. But there are vocations in the SAF uh, and I see uh, you know, especially with uh, new modern equipment and new uh, concepts of warfare, uh, women are increasingly being, um, uh, you know, put in a place where uh, the, the, the disparity between men and women in terms of competence, uh, the gap is narrowing, you know, uh, and I'm very proud, you know, and hopeful that more women will be able to uh, succeed and take on uh, leadership and command appointments in the SAF in the years to come. Now, the third, the third reason, you know, why uh, there are far fewer women than men, I think, you know, I would attribute it to internal barriers, internal barriers uh, that women ourselves have to overcome. And by that, I, you know, I would, you know, recall uh, being in the SAF, I was also mentor to quite a few young women, promising young women, you know, women who choose to sign on, you know, they are very motivated and very talented people. Um, and yet, uh, quite often, uh, even amongst them, uh, uh, you know, a few choose to uh, uh, step out, still choose to step aside, you know, when opportunities are available and they are asked to uh, take on higher appointments. Uh, some women are hesitant. There's this um, self-doubt, you know, uh, fear that maybe they're not good enough or fear that they're not ready. And sometimes it's about priorities, personal choices, you know, feel the feeling that uh, they're going to start a family soon and that uh, they're worried that they may not be able to juggle um, higher appointments, more responsibilities with uh, family life well. Um, so I think these are very real internal uh, barriers that uh, only women ourselves have to overcome. Um, and you know, in the first panel just now, there was a uh, discussion about how there's also fear, fear, you know, uh, that women often express, fear of being judged, uh, fear of making wrong choices, uh, fear of overreaching. And I think perhaps the biggest fear of all that I see uh, sometimes, you know, amongst women, amongst us is fear of not being a good enough uh, mother, wife, or daughter. These are very real uh, struggles, I think we have to um, uh, uh, learn to uh, get around. And for me, you know, personally, I, I always tell myself, I, I'm not a superwoman. I'm not a wonder woman. I cannot be in two places at one time. I cannot choose to be perfect in everything. So I have to learn how to um, accept, accept that, um, you know, uh, uh, what, you know, what drives me has to be based on my sense of purpose you know, uh, what I feel, you know, I will be most comfortable with, um, you know, in, in the choices that I make um, and not, not expect myself, you know, to be 100% everywhere, um, every time and at every place, you know. Um, so that's, that's uh, first point 
Uh, second one is about gender gap. I think gender gap still exists. Um, but fortunately, I, I see that it's closing. Um, the gap is closing. When Singapore first gained independence, um, about maybe about three in 10 uh, women were literate uh, compared to about seven in 10 men you know, in, uh, who are literate. Today, today, if you look at the data, actually uh, nine in 10 women have post-secondary education and higher, and that's on par with men. So actually, I think the education uh, gap has closed uh, tremendously in the last uh, six decades or so. Um, this, you know, uh, this to me is a very good sign uh, that women will be uh, more equipped and better empowered to do more things and to pursue their goals. I mean, I for one, you know, um, I went to RGS. Um, I, I, I learned, you know, from many uh, other inspiring uh, women around me and uh, being in an all-girls school, I learned you know, at a very young age that actually women can do a lot of things by ourselves. And I'm glad that you know, that phase in my life uh, shaped my perspective about how uh, women, we really can choose what we want to be you know, if we want it, if we want it. Yeah. Um, and I also look at my uh, own family, you know, my um, grandmother, my mother, myself and my daughter, and I can see huge progress. You know, my grandmother, uh, she was a rubber plantation worker. You know, my mother, uh, she had to help out in the family. Uh, she's, you know, one of the 10 children. And uh, um, it was a you know, very, very poor family. They all had to help out in uh, the farms. Uh, my mother got married uh, very young and um, she stayed as a housewife. Um, she sacrificed, you know, uh, um, herself to take care of the family. That to me is a lot of power. Um, and for me, you know, I'm really fortunate to be able to get good education, um, have access to good career choices. And now I look at my three daughters, you know, uh, the oldest is 18 years old. She's preparing for A-levels, by the way. Um, the youngest is nine years old, primary three. And they have so many more opportunities, you know, than I had when I was a child. Um, I look at how they're enjoying themselves and developing their talent in performing arts, um, in sports, and at the same time, you know, uh, getting good education. I'm so hopeful, so hopeful that um, when my children, when my daughters grow up, they'll be even better, you know, than, than me. So I, I think there's hope, there's a gap, but the gap's closing. Even in the workplace, you know, we see that uh, the uh, women participation in the labor force has actually been steadily growing. Actually, the men labor participation rate is still higher than women. That's true, but the gap is closing. And you know, while the 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 men uh, labor participation rate has uh, kind of plateaued at what seventy five percent or so for women, it's still growing. You know, so I think there is a lot of hope for us um, to close the gap. The third message that I have um, is about how you know. Uh, there's no single definition of success for women and women can be powerful in many ways. In fact, you know, it echoes uh, the discussion, many of the, the, the perspectives shared in the first panel. I'd like to share um, a short paragraph um, taken from a book by Cheryl Sandberg uh, in her first book called Lean In. Um, and here it goes, I quote, while I believe that increasing the number of women in positions of power is a necessary element of true equality, I do not believe that there is one definition of success or happiness. Not all women want careers. Not all women want children. Not all women want both. I would never advocate that we should all have the same objectives. Many people are not interested in acquiring power, not because they lack ambition, but because they are living their lives as they desire. Some of the most important contributions to our world are made by caring for one person at a time. We each have to chart our own unique course and define which goals fit our lives, values, and dreams. While well, I will end here, you know, I feel that um, you know, as we discuss more about the concepts of power, power struggles, um, you know, uh, we ought to have um, you know, an open mind about um, what success means to each of us and um, how 
there are different sources of power in lives. I look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of State, Gan Xiao Huang, for your insight. Okay, if you were riveted by the first panel, wait till we hear the second. Jennifer Lowe, Chair of the OWC, is our moderator for the question, Power, a zero-sum game? We kindly invite the panelists to turn on their video. Over to you, Jen. Hi, thank you, Doreen, um, for the introduction. And thank you, Minister of State, Ken Xiaohuang, for that lead in to our panel. Um, I think we've, we've got a lot to catch up on. You know, panel one had a really great discussion. And I think we have, um, they're really on fire, igniting a lot of that power in that first, first panel, even in the chat group. Um, so please continue to put in your comments, your questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to bring on the speakers for this second panel, um, Power, a zero-sum game. Um, we're going to look at some of the things that were already talked about, maybe follow up on some of the things that were talked about earlier, but maybe also take this out of the, the gender conversation as well. I think that was, this is one of the things that came up in the, in the chat group earlier. But um, let me just start by introducing the, the speakers on this panel. Um, Yen Lu, Yen Lu Chao. He needs no introduction for a lot of people. Yen Lu is a successful entrepreneur um, and VC in the tech and media space and has now devoted most of his time to supporting mental health and wellness for youth and adults. He's most more recently co-founded Asia Institute of Mentoring. And it seems each time I meet Yen Lu, he has some new initiative up his sleeve. Yen Lu, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for having me. Uh, such a great honor and pleasure. I was listening earlier on the first panel. Uh, great conversation. I'm very, you know, very delighted and very lucky to be part of this conversation. Anyway, a bit about myself, is it? I have two minutes. That's okay, thank you. Yeah, I actually came from a very, very humble background. Uh, have a humble beginning. I was born in Taiwan. Uh, my family moved to Okinawa. I, I don't know how many of you know Okinawa. It's a little, very beautiful island just south of Japan, about a thousand miles in the East China Sea. Uh, and Okinawa, for some of you may know, it was the origin of Ikigai. You all know about Ikigai, right? <laughs> Everybody talks about Ikigai now, which is, uh, translates to purpose or meaning of life or reason for being. Uh, so I live as a teenager and then moved to the U.S., studied in the U.S., uh, work in the U.S. now back in, back in Asia, in Singapore. I've been here for 25 years now and counting here in Singapore. Um, I journey as a start of my life as an engineer um, in the tech space. I've been a tech entrepreneur multi-times been a VC and a business angel, so been very active in the startup ecosystem, been a mentor and advisor to many others, to the government as well, on their innovation initiatives all around. Uh, now, you know, uh, about 12 years ago, I, um, because of a family event, a, a tragedy, uh, that I became, uh, I got onto the social space, uh, became a philanthropist and social innovator. I also became a student of spirituality and sp seeker of truth. So I went through about, I went through five or six major, major career and life transitions. I had to reinvent my career and my life many times over. Uh, and uh, so, so there, uh, uh, as Jen mentioned, there are, there are four or five pillars that underpin all my work these days. One is mental wellness. Another one is mentoring, obviously to bring mentoring to all aspects of society to raise the profile of mentoring, uh, sustainability, uh, and, and entrepreneurship. Yeah, and my, my sort of reason for being, uh, one of the reasons for being is to really empower young people, everyone really on their journey in self-discovery, healing, and transformation. And that's power. Over back to you, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yanlu. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Jingjin, so Jingjin Liu is CEO and co-founder of Sazazu. It's a taboo breaking venture with a mission to normalize sexual well-being for women. I'm going to let Jingjin talk a little bit more about that. Jingjin is also a mother of a three-year-old philanthropist. Jingjin. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Jen, for the introduction. And I'm truly honored to share a little bit to be a panelist at um, this occasion. I am, I'm originally from China and um, moved to Germany when I was 16 um, because I, going back to a bit of the, what panel one mentioned many times, I was a very odd kid when I grew up. I didn't have my parents were not around me and my grandparents were very self-involved at that time. And I have compared to a Chinese, mainland Chinese person, very dark skin. And I was very bad bullied when I was, um, was, uh, was a young, young kid. So I didn't have a great uh, childhood. So I was the kind of not good girl <laughs> Uh, in, in the Chinese traditional kind of um, uh, perception. So I decided to move to Germany when I was 16, where I felt I want to go to a country where individualism is more celebrated. And I studied industrial engineering. I pursued a very male dominated industry and to become the first female marketing director in a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, automotive firm in Germany and run my own company on the, um, on the side. And um, I, it has always been a true calling and mission for me deep inside because I grew up with zero confidence as a woman. And going to Germany has truly opened my eyes of opportunities and how women can establish themselves and how men can play a significant role as supporting women and bring women on the, uh, into the right stage. And um, four years ago, I came to Singapore and to expand at that time my own business and uh, the business eventually got uh, acquired in 2019. And I thought now is the time I, to follow my true dream to empower women to do something in the female empowerment space. At that time, the definition was very vague. There are many, many different, there are career coaching, there are lean in groups, so on and so forth. I personally truly felt, I never felt in any of them was truly touching the innate confidence space of women. And I feel a lot of narrative was around, you should ask for more salary, you should ask for board seats. And very often I feel if women, I had a lot of conversation with young women and with um, um, also my senior peers at that time, we, we find out is that women, the reason that women don't ask for some of the things is that women ultimately don't feel entitled to position, to more salary. They don't feel they are enough deep inside. So I thought I want to, how can I tackle that? And um, long story short, uh, where, where, where can I help women to build innate confidence? And at the same time, there is a business opportunity. Therefore, I decided to went down the route of sexual well-being and sexual health. So really to truly help women to build a community, to build a network, to build a platform, to empower women to understand their sexuality. And through education, consultation, as well as product angle, to empower women to own their sexuality. Great, thank you, Jinkin. Um, and Andrew, Andrew Tan, um, he's an ecosystem builder, a husband, a doting brother. And the reason why I know this is because the first time I met Andrew for coffee, he had just driven his sister to a bowling, to bowling training. So I hope my brother is listening and taking notes. Um, Andrew's career has spent um, entrepreneurship um, venture cap startups, and he gives back through mentoring startups and garnering community of, of entrepreneurs for charitable causes through Makan for Hope, the movement he co-founded. So, Andrew. Ben, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad, I'm so grateful to be here because as a Rhodesian, this is actually my first alumni event. Um, going back to, you know, my RI days, my education path, I think it was less than conventional because I did go to RI for my O-levels, but I went to Hua Chong JC for my A-levels. And, you know, uh, fact is I didn't do well. So I went into a private university at SIM. I studied there for two years before I went to R uh, US to complete my degree at University at Buffalo. After college, you know, I've already discovered a little bit of, you know, the type of environment that I would thrive. So I committed my career to the startup ecosystem in different areas, you know, uh, as Jen shared, as a social entrepreneur, as a startup builder, as an investor, advisor, mentor. Now, today, I'm the country manager of Wantedly. And Wantedly, we help companies attract talents through employer branding. 
Um, as also shared, I'm the co-founder of Makan for Hope with Elise, a RGS and fellow Hua Chong alum. She's here today, I believe. And together we are building an ecosystem for the startup community to grow by learning, networking, and most importantly, doing good together. And in terms of, you know, what drives me, what's my North Star, right? I aspire to help people help others. And to that end, I would like to share my favorite quote. The purpose of life is the life of purpose. So today I've discovered my purpose and I can fulfill it thanks to the positive influence from many strong women. And maybe I, I'm referencing some uh, sharing and anecdotes from the first panel, right? But from, from my family at home first, of course, we have my very first teacher and that is my mom. And, and my mom, you know, the, our, our previous generation, right? They weren't really uh, educated. They didn't have opportunities to, to go through the education system that we did, but she did her very best. She went above and beyond to make sure I got uh, you know, education that she couldn't have. And then talking about my sister, she's my idol. She's a national bowler. And, and I want to, you know, give her a shout out because, and, and her teammates as well, because bowling is a sport that really you don't, necessarily see men uh, as, as one category and women as one category. A lot of tournaments in bowling, men and women play together. And I think that's power. That's power in itself. And Singapore should really be proud of our national bowlers because we have world champions in our midst. And I need to definitely mention uh, my pillar of support. I think she's tuning in. My wife is what drives me every day to become better. I would like to quickly talk about my family away from home as well. You know, my respective co-founders uh, through the years from different projects, uh, including Elise, all of you have been inspirational and passionate women. And then I need to talk about my CEO at Wantali, Akiko Naka. She's the youngest woman to lead a public listed company in Tokyo. And we know how male dominated the society is in Japan. So all of them have ignited this passion, this purpose within me. And if power was a zero-sum game, that wouldn't have been possible. I'm super excited today to be on this panel, super excited for this topic. I cannot wait to learn from everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. I hope those um, examples of females were not just brought up just for this. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. Um, next up, Leon. Leon Cho, he's an impact investor. He's executive director of Damson Capital. So Leon was recently also tasked by MP Kerry Tan, who was actually the co-chair for our inaugural um, Reflection Women's Conference and one of our speakers then as well. Um, he was tasked by her to set up RISE, which is a charity that supports men's um, social, emotional and physical and financial well-being. So Leon is dialing in from San Francisco today. How's the weather there, Leon? A bit chilly. I have to put on a jacket, actually, Jen. So I think you know it's a bit of a cold spell here. But I, I think thank you so much for having me here. Um, it is so impressive to hear the quality of the conversation that you know the, the first panel had. I'm looking forward to this panel with such an amazing group of people. But I think you know that this really um, speaks to the quality and you know exemplary nature of uh, women from the Frisian community who are pushing themselves so uh, to to do better for themselves, but also not just for women, but also pushing the agenda of Singapore and and raising a flag you know globally. So I think it's amazing, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Leon Tom, the executive director of Damson Capital. Um, Damson Capital is an impact investment and advisory firm based here in Singapore. Um, basically, we invest um, and support uh, social entrepreneurs to uh, build uh, companies who are going to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So that's um, a lot of the work that I do. Um, you know, just in a nutshell, I had a bit of a eccentric um, a background starting my career actually uh, in, in the reporting uh, world uh, as, a, as a reporter, and then going to the oil and gas uh, segment, um, uh, coming out of that, and then going back to university where I actually 
through that, you know, spend about um, a year studying uh, coffee farmers in Timor Leste and trying to understand emerging market um, issues there and how do we solve famine issues for um, smallholder farmers uh, in places like Timor Leste. Um, I came back to Singapore and had a two-year uh, consulting, um, uh, you know, career. And after that, I founded Damson Capital uh, to actually help um, social entrepreneurs in their journey, especially if we could rejig and move um, capitalism in a way which is actually beneficial to the environment and people. Um, and I think that's been a really exciting journey for me for the last uh, six, seven years already. Um, I think, and, and you know, the, the other very, very important thing in my life today has been about Rice Community, which is um, uh, one of the uh, charities I, I uh, co-founded um, and was tasked to set up um, with uh, MP Terry Tan. And I think RISE is, you know, hopefully a, um, a response to some of the challenges that we see. And today we are talking about women and power of women and, you know, the dynamics of power as well. But we cannot, uh, and, and I think I do hear a lot of voices saying that, you know, what about not just owning the responsibility of how do we elevate women, but also how do we get men to participate in this power dynamic? And I, I love the fact that, you know, we are having that conversation. And I noted that there was another question that said, you know, um, how, why should women take responsibility for toxic masculinity? And I absolutely agree. The first responsibility of anything to do with that, that kind of element of toxic masculinity should be the men. And I can, I can and, and one of the, the reasons that I, I decided to support, you know, the, the RISE um, community initiative was because of what happened last year, where we saw a lot of cases of, you know, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, stereotypical situations where women were in very dangerous situations or, be, or we saw domestic abuse going up, for example. And whether we like it or not, there is a stereotype of where the gender roles were in contributing to domestic violence. Now it's okay to pull people out, women out specifically to get them safety. But the real question is at the end of the day, they still have to go home and still be faced with a lot of these challenges. So the real question is then if we take that power dynamic and reverse it, how do we then actually have men contribute to a way and a new way of working um, for um, you know, this dynamic. And, and it's not only the fact that it's just about toxic masculinity facing women, but also it's toxic to themselves because at the end of the day, the stereotype that and the stigma of what it means to be a breadwinner when you lose your job is hugely, you know, uh, very, very uh, challenging and it affects them even in the mental health and sometimes even disempowers them. And when they have very poor examples of negative masculine leadership, in the household or in the community, it exacerbates itself. So we need to stop that. And then we need to also apply a lens for a conversation that is inclusive, not just for men within men, but also for the entire community, including women. And I think that's really important that we are saying that one, men need the help, but two, men have a, a role to contribute to this. So I'm really excited. I'm gonna pause it right there. I'm so excited to hear from the rest of the panelists. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And such important work too, I think, for everybody to be taking responsibility for all segments of the community to be taking responsibility for inequities. So not just the ones who are at the receiving end, but also everybody else. So we will get into that a little bit later, I think. Um, so Michelle, Michelle Young, she is a lawyer in maritime litigation. She's a mother of three. Um, she's an active, she's active in women's law, lawyer groups um, to raise awareness on issues such as sexual harassment and encouraging mentorship between women. So Michelle has received accolades in her professional life in photography. She's actually a self-taught photographer and has been named in prestige magazines 40 under 40 list. Michelle. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm so happy to be at an alumni event. Um, so my name is Michelle. First of all, I'm a daughter of a better age. My grandmother came to Singapore from China on board a cargo ship, she was 17 and illiterate. She wrote the wave of the Singapore story from third world to first. 
And because of her courage, I went to RGS. Anyone else here from Halley House? I graduated in 97, and I'm now a shipping lawyer. So from a young girl on a cargo ship to a shipping lawyer, I am so grateful. I'm the first female partner in my shipping oil and gas and international trade department in my international law firm, where the face of leadership was traditionally male and white. Next, I hope to raise daughters for a better age. I'm a mother of three girls, ages 11, nine, and four. They are infuriating. I've got one sitting up opposite me now. Um, so opinionated um, and mostly delightful. My dear Amma is proud of me, but thinks I'm only fulfilled if I have a son. So once in a while, she tells me she's still hoping, she's still hoping and praying I bear a male heir for my in-laws. But I just smile because I know the value of girls. I hope my daughters realize how privileged they are and that with great opportunity comes the responsibility to raise others up. I'm also a sister in learning. I learn from the causes that I'm interested in, gender diversity, mentorship, unconscious bias, and from the committees I sit on, on the Women's International Shipping and International Trade Association and the Women in Practice Committee of the Law Society in Singapore. Oh, finally, I learned from my husband of 13 years who comes from a family of three brothers and sometimes seems so clueless about women. He's listening in somewhere. We spent a long time working through the power struggle between us and realized that one could only win if we both won. And so we now volunteer with a marriage and family church ministry. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And, and Michelle and your husband, you're going to be speaking this afternoon also. <laughs> and love to hear about that power struggle there, if there was yeah. one. Um, Soraya, um, Soraya Zaino Abedin, she's a mother of four. She's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Singapore General Hospital with a subspecialty in orthopedic oncology. A rarity it is already and a female at that. And on top of that, Soraya is also a TikToker with over 120,000 views on the channel. I just visited that today. <laughs> Creating videos that demystify the operating theater for lay people like me, <laughs> Soraya. Thanks, Jen. Thank you very much. And good morning to everyone. I'm really honored to be on this panel today. And um, it's an interesting topic that's been um, assigned to be discussed in this panel, which is, is power a zero-sum game? You know, the, the previous panel discussion really brought up so many interesting issues, and I feel that there's so much more to be discussed. Um, so is it really so that if power is transferred from men to women, do men then lose the power completely? And, you know, what happens to the total amount of power? Is it really a zero-sum game? Does the power remain the same? I think that probably isn't true. I think... Um, it's not about transfer of power or who's in charge or who has the power, but it's about really helping to empower women. Um, I don't think we're looking to take charge, but I think we're looking to have a voice and be seen and be heard. And I'm, I'm coming from a place where I feel like I've been on the outside for a lot of my career. Um, you know, as Jen said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, traditionally in the world, that's less than 10% of female consultants in orthopedic surgery. And, um, you know, in Singapore, it's about 5% only. So getting into orthopedic surgery was already an uphill task. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I turned up for my interview eight months pregnant with my first child. Um, and um, I went through a few rounds of interviews. So I was working in London at the time. And I initially interviewed to be to come back to Singapore and be employed as a doctor. And then from there, I interviewed to get into my orthopedic residency. So when I interviewed with this elderly Chinese doctor who is very high ranking in Ministry of Health, um, you know, turning up eight months pregnant, he kind of looked at me and then looked at my belly and said, how many children are you planning to have? You know, and at the age of 27 or 28, I didn't realize what an inappropriate question that was and how inappropriate it was for him to be questioning me on my family plans. But uh, I kind of awkwardly laughed and said, well, we'll see. And um, 
sillily or, or you know, not sillily, I asked him in the same interview, you know, what are the options for working part-time in Singapore? And um, he looked at me again and he scoffed and said, you know, women doctors either leave or they work full-time. There's no in-between. You know, so that was over 10 years ago. And um, I, I hope and I think that um, these sort of gender biases have evolved and that we are more open towards women, especially women in medicine or in very demanding professions, having a family and trying to balance it all. Because indeed, it is a loss when women feel like they don't have a place in the workplace because they have a family and they can't juggle it all. Um, I don't think it's a failing of the woman. I think that's a failing of the system because the system has failed to, to support them through this journey. Uh, I mean, in Singapore, we have 16 weeks of paid maternity leave. And while that's better than many countries, it, it is also still lacking. And I think there's a lot of support that we can be given to women who are trying to juggle motherhood and working and um, trying to climb the corporate ladder and really trying to get some power and be seen and be heard. Um, you know, I'd just like to also touch briefly on COVID. You know, Minister Gan said that um, the gender inequalities are, uh, are narrowing and, you know, women are more educated compared to in the 70s and 80s and employment is also increasing for women. That is very much true and I'm grateful and I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, the gender gap, uh, I mean, the pay inequality in, in between the genders is still there. And um, we find that um, it's because many women are still not rising in the corporate ladders and not getting the high paid jobs. More, more women than men have the low paid jobs. And in times of crisis, for example, now in COVID, we find that the women are getting disproportionately affected by it. So more women are leaving their jobs. Um, more women are having to shoulder the burden of home-based learning, increasing home demands. And this is because it's just the norm. You know, the childcare duties or the, the running of the household kind of falls onto the woman. And that in itself is, in, is an inequality of power because if women felt empowered to say, no, this is not right, we have to share this burden, then women wouldn't be facing this problem of more of them losing jobs and more of them feeling stressed out and having more of a mental load. So I, I do think that there's still a large gender inequality um, that needs to be addressed. And, and a lot of that has to do with institutionalized barriers um, such as, you know, as I said, maternity leave, um, and even things which we may not even think about, like, um, for example, in the past, about 20 years ago, there was uh, a gender quota for taking in medical students because there was a fear that women would leave the workforce and it was a waste of time and waste of resources to train them. And I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that's been lifted. Um, but these are institutionalized barriers which have implications 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Because of this, we don't have so many females who are senior consultants, head of, heads of departments. And if you don't see women who are in positions of power or positions um, where they're able to make a change for the better of women, then women are not gonna be, feel confident to rise up to that place where they might want to see themselves. So the reason why I've decided to go on TikTok is because I feel like you know, it's important to have discussions like this, but I'm not sure how many RGS girls or how many, how many of the youngsters will tune in to a panel like this. And I want them to have that frame shift of their mindset from an early age. I mean, I was really shocked um, when my daughter, my eldest daughter, she's 10 this year and she's in primary four. And a couple of years ago, I asked her what she wanted to be. And she really likes aeroplanes. Um, and she said, uh, I, I said to her, do you want to be a pilot? And she said, oh, no, I, I mean, I, like, I would like to, but um, aren't pilots all boys? And I was so shocked. I mean, like, here I am, surgeon mom, you know, orthopedic oncology, and my daughter thinks that she can't be a pilot because she's a girl. So I think that um, these mindsets are ingrained from young, and there is only a certain proportion that you can override or you can influence your children from home. There's so much more they're, in, they're exposed to outside you know, when they go to school, from media. And I think, you know, it, there's so much more that can be done to engage our youth, our children, um, not just the girls, the boys as well, you know, to, to let them know that, you know, women have a space, girls have a space, and uh, we should be heard, we should be seen. And um, I want to be an example for young women out there.
Thank you, Soraya. Wow, a lot to unpack from that alone. I think, um, you know, echoed quite a lot of um, what uh, Minister Gunn had actually already started talking about. You know, these barriers that we, we face, the external barriers, the internal barriers, you know, a lot of this is about that mindset shift. But, you know, I think there, what is important too, to is to highlight some of these um, inequities and some of these things that are happening um, for that for change to happen because it has to be known and, and people need to hear about it for them to be aware and, and to do something about it. So I'd like to invite the other speakers to turn on your videos and your, your mics as well. We're doing this as a, as a conversation. I, I know there are a couple of uh, speakers here already probably who want to follow up on that. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, maybe uh, Michelle um, if you could share or Jingjing Jing, to share some of these other things that you have may have um, sort of um, encountered in your personal and professional lives. I'll, I'll just jump in. And um, I think it's one of the very, just very recent um, stories um, that I have. I mean, I am, recent story, I'm in a um, taboo breaking space in the startup ecosystem and um, a very different kind of startup, like, like especially in a fairly conservative region where we're living in still. And uh, I have very interest having a lot of conversation with investors, institutional as well as um, angel investors. And I had this very interesting conversation with a very, a traditional Singaporean guy had been in the UK for a very long time, very well respected in this region. And I was pitching to him about the sexual well-being, how can we make an ecosystem out of it and why it's important. And he said, it's all important, I fully agree. But the reason why you can't risk institutional investment is because you need a male co-founder. And the interesting part is in our space, currently the narrative goes a lot about, I have a lot of male driven companies coming to me say, oh, we need a female co-founder because now the Me Too, female empowerment, very important. You have to have the gender lens. And this was the very first time I hear someone tell me, you have to have a male co-founder. And I wonder, I was like, why? And he said, because traditionally, women have no say in sex, tax, and the politics. At, at the beginning, I was very shocked. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is, um, 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 having been, you know, in the space and having been in venture space in, in the overseas, I have never heard something that is, how do you even have the audacity to say that? But then when he started to argue, I slowly start to understand and reflect that a lot of no's I have gotten from institutional investors, from men or from women as well, is that in this space, traditionally women don't have representative in this region. So in the moment where women pitch, let's say for a, um, a, a male dominated panel and about female sexual well-being or politics or any of the space, what he mentioned, you don't have a voice that represent you. They don't echo with what, what you are saying. And since, and then if you go back very often in the venture space, it, people go back to see, okay, what have worked in the past? What have, you know, what has been successful in the past? And you see that most of this business are still driven by men. Even the most successful sexual well-being company in the world are also driven by men. And he had a point. And that gave me a lot of reflection actually in this space. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and these are current you know, things that are still happening today. As much as we'd like to think things have moved on and Sarai, you've, you've experienced things, you know, 10 years ago, you know, I, I, and I think Shalini also just reflected on how she's also experienced the same. We want things to change. And, you know, things are slowly moving. I think the, um, the gender gap, the education gap that, that we've talked about getting closed in helps a little bit, but there's this mindset gap as well. Yeah, Jen, you know, I just want to jump in and pick up on what Jinjin Jin just said, right, about, you know, what she was told about how, um, you know, you need a female on the team. You know, I just want to want to say that, you know, we need to be very careful about tokenism. You know, that's something that um, I've noticed, like what I said, that I was first female partner, right? And, you know, it's something that, that sometimes is being put out there. We have female partners, so therefore we are diverse, but it needs to be genuine. Um, 
you know, and I think as women, we need to be really, really careful about that. And sometimes I feel that, you know, we, we as women don't want to be promoted um, or recognized because we are female, but because we are, but because we are actually competent. Um, another point I want to raise um, is what Minister Gan said just now, you know, saying that, you know, your worth is seen when you show that you are competent but another issue I feel um, that I face in the workforce is, is that, you know, and, and what I've witnessed, right, is that the women partner, the male partners are good, but the women partners in my firm are outstanding, right, in order to, in order to survive or to be promoted in a workplace. It's not just, you don't just need to be competent, you need to be ultra, ultra competent. Mm. And, you know, what Suraya shared really resonated with me, you know, about being pregnant. I mean, I've, I've had three kids. Um, well, my firm has been supportive, saw me two, three kids, but, um, you know, there, there, there have been biases. Like when I was pregnant the first time um, and I told my damn boss, you know, his reaction was, you know, I think a real genuine um, sort of sense of shame. Um, you know, what a pity, Michelle. I was looking forward to see your career take off. And I was thinking, why can't my career still take off, right? Um, you know, and then I went on to have, um, well, two more, two more kids. And just want maybe a final point about thriving in the workplace and bias, right? And um, I think not just that the workplace is not made for women, I think things, even very, very small things like conferences, right? Like here we have a male, female panel is very, is very balanced. But I've been to so many conferences where I've been the only female speaker. Again, tokenism, maybe they wanted a female on the panel, um, but maybe the female voice is less recognized. Another thing was um, I also attended a conference and I was speaking and I just had my third child. And well, I was still, I was still breastfeeding and you to express milk. And I said, is there a room? And they were like, oh, we never thought about it. Um, and apart from that, you know, when, when I just had my baby, I also had a hearing in the, um, I had an arbitration hearing and that was at Maxwell Chambers where Singapore built to be a world-class, you know, high technolo technology um, venue for, arbitrations to take place, international arbitrations where people could come, right? And I was the female partner um, leading that matter and well, still breastfeeding my child, right? So in terms of timing, um, you know, I had, I had a real problem. I had a tribunal, three men, all my witnesses were men. My opponent lawyers were male. I was practically the only, I was well, the only female there. And I was like, oh dear, how do I say that the one hour lunch break is not gonna be long enough for me you know, and I didn't dare to speak up, but I was thinking, why are the buildings not designed for women who need to do their job, right? So I went, to the, I went to the reception and I said, hey, do you have a room where, you know, I can express milk and a refrigerator? And they said, oh, no, you have to book a room. You have to pay for it, um, which was the norm there. And I said, well, but this is a different need that I have, right? And so in the end, I had to use the handicapped toilet, um, borrow the pantry refrigerator, and, you know, and this is the same with the courts as well, the Singapore courts, there's no space for women who are, who are new moms to do what they need to do in order to do their jobs. Um, Jen, I, I just wanted to, to, to chime in, as, especially hearing from Michelle. I mean, she, uh, Michelle, you're quite a powerhouse there. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing in, in, in reflection is I, I'm a male, I co-founded a jury company, and um, I have other males who tell me, why are, you, why are you founding a jury company, right? Like, do you, do you wear earrings or something? And I don't, but, you know, it's a very different perspective. And it's interesting that, that um, I think uh, the, the gender roles are also flipped on the other way as well. And I get imposed perspectives of why do I, you know, support certain things. Um, and I, I think that that needs to also shift in itself and, and recognize so that we can also be more empathetic to the other side and recognizing that there are shortcomings on, on, on our side and recognizing the power dynamic. I mean, something as simple as, you know, um, having a discussion and recognizing the source of truth or source of the common in the room and saying, oh yeah, it was Jen who gave me that really good idea. Let me build on that. I mean, that in itself already, you know, expounds, you know, the voice of the person who is at the room. And for me, I think the, the, the element of um, not just breaking down the barriers, but I think the next step of that we've been working on in Singapore, not just breaking the barriers, the next step is how do we systematically create 
the inclusivity that that is really authentic and sincere to women. Because for me, you know, we we follow at least within my company a, 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 um, the spirit and guideline of four things that a person needs to be, to be seen, a person needs to feel safe, a person needs to feel that they're included, they're connected, and that they lastly because of all those elements systematically they feel that they can be courageous to be themselves and they can also be courageous to contribute right as themselves and i think that that's the 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 element of the next step of not just breaking the barriers but once we're in the room how do we also make sure that these voices not only shine so that it's not just about how you be outstanding so you can be within the club. It's about just saying, how do we just bring the best of everybody to the table? And I, I think that that's just the, the, the real next step that we need to start working on, of course, uh, and also architecturally, you know, um, <laughs> making sure we have the, 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 the rooms uh, for women as well to, to support their needs. So yeah, absolutely agree. I, I'd like to pick up on some things. I think, I, Leon, I think that's a really good good point about, you know, kind of seeing that, um, you know, that inclusivity within your, within the boardroom and, you know, where to start, where better to start than um, at work and with people that you work with where there are, is already, um, you know, diversity, right? But I'd, I'd also like to pick up on the point that Michelle um, talked about, which was, you know, kind of that tokenism, right? You know, the whole DEI, you know, in companies, how much of it really is that, that tokenistic um, sort of a, a gesture? Because like she says, I mean, women almost have to work doubly hard. I mean, they have to work harder to prove themselves. They don't just have to be competent. They have to be ultra competent. So in there lies that inequity where, you know, we, we're not starting from the same place. You know, there is um, essentially women need a little bit more of a leg up. So what can we do, you know, to help women give that leg up? I love what you said, um, Leon, about sort of giving credit to where credit is due, um, but what else? Oh, is it addressing to me or the, to the no, panel? No, any, anybody. Yalu, Andrew? Um, if you mind if I chime in, I just um, want to touch on the tokenism thing. Um, I think tokenism sounds like a very bad word in that it feels like the person who is being used as a token is not being valued um, and is not being heard. But I think in the past when you know, there was an effort to include women or other minorities, yes, possibly there was an element of tokenism, but it I'm sure it has served some of its purpose in that if these women weren't put there as tokens, they would have never been heard in the first place. So I think even though it is a bad concept, it is a necessary evil to get us somewhere to get our foot in the door at least so that this token woman can at least let her voice be heard, maybe open the doors for other women to come in. Because if you don't see any women at all, even if there are no token women, then there's never gonna be any women in the future. So. I think, okay, label it as tokenism, but take it and run with it. Use it for what it is. I and completely agree with Soraya as a blunt instrument, but I work. So, you know, happy to say I'm the first female partner in my department. Sometimes the firm thinks it's a bit embarrassing. Why, why was there only like one after 20 years? But you know what? I'm running with it. Yeah, you're there, you know? I agree. And, and I, I, I also think that, you know, I mean, look, the, the word tokenism is, is negative. I think Soraya rightly says that. But... I also believe that we, we need to have good examples um, and, and individuals who are stepping up in those leadership roles to, to show other you know, young women that it is not only possible. I mean, Michelle, for example, her story is just fantastic, right? That she can do all this. And sometimes, you know, we, we are trying to play a cultural barrier. I mean, to me, the spirit of it all is to, to get to a situation where, you know, we, we know that women can do it. To me, the diversity element is that the competency exists, the capability exists. Now the question is, do we have the system that recognizes that it actually exists already and we can just bring all this, we can elevate these, these qualities up because systematically we've also pushed it down. I, I agree, you know, um, change has to start from somewhere and uh, tokenism, it, it's a blunt instrument, but we've all had to be intentional about moving this change, shifting this change. 
And you know, if we look at it on the flip side, today we are at the Revision Women's Conference. And yesterday I was sharing with uh, a contact, you know, about this event. And the first thing he did, the first reaction he did was to laugh. Are you an RGS alumni? You know, and, and I had to take pains to explain to him, right? That, hey, uh, obviously I don't think, you know, Leon, Yen Lu and me are tokens today, but you know, a conversation about women, about power, about, you know, balancing all of that is not limited to women, right? And an event organized by RGS alumni need not just be restricted to women only. So I think that we, we need to push for that. And, and if at the starting point, you know, we need to be more intentional, more deliberate uh, to fight those hurdles, um, so be it. And one thing I'm very excited to see, you know, in the coming years is right now it's necessary, you know, to, to uplift women founded companies. We need to have initiatives revolving around female founders. You know, we have awards like 100 Women in Tech. We have roundtables about female founders. But why does it have to be founders versus female founders? I hope for the day that, you know, um, men or women, it's, it's all founders alike. All success is celebrated and supported. And really when I'm in a panel with, uh, you know, all the outstanding people like you guys, I I find it's a privilege for myself. It's, it's, it's uh, never a token, yeah. Um, yeah, there's one more point that Tsing Tsing raised also, you know, a lot of sort of female product, female brand type of companies are founded or helmed by men. And I think today we are all more woke. We are a little bit more progressive, right, in our consumer decisions. I don't think I'll buy like, you know, a, a female brand, uh, you know, whose, whose face is not a female, who's, who's not a lady. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think the shift is also starting already. It has started. And you know, optimistic about what's to come. I think I, mean, I just want to add one point to everyone who said. Um, he said that I think it's need to start actually from educational level. What occurs to me very often is that, for example, when Michelle said, I am the only female, I am the first female, you know, partner in this law firm. I don't know how she felt that way, but very often women, we are brought up to be humble, to be the good girl. Don't brag about your success. To be humility, to be humble and so on. And this actually has ruined very often where, where, um, in, in, in a room with men. And then if the man is the, the, the youngest, the first, the whatever, they will say it very proudly and loudly. And women often, oh, I think I shouldn't raise that point because people will think that I am bragging or I am, it's, it's, there is a bad societal connotation to that. And I think there is, and this is something that we need to bring young girls from the beginning and to say things loudly, loudly and proudly of their achievement. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I totally agree with Jingxian, actually. And it's, it's not just a gender thing. It's definitely a cultural thing. I think there's a very strong Asian influence of like, don't brag about yourself. Don't show what you're doing. You know, don't broadcast where you live and that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying you have to, but I think if you're proud of yourself and you've done something good and you think it's going to be beneficial to other people to see that, you know, women can do that or you want to be an example, go ahead. You should say it. And the second thing I want to say is I want to really thank Andrew and Yen Lu and Leon for being here because as I look back on my journey to getting where I am today, I wouldn't have been able to do it without men who have supported me along the way, empowered men who have seen the potential in me, have encouraged me, have given me opportunities at work. Definitely not the guy who interviewed me when I was pregnant, but <laughs> you know, other people along the way, like my boss, for example, my dad, my husband, who shoulders mm. a lot of the mothering or the child wearing, you know, he's he's helped me to be here. And I think if you're not the person in power or you're not the gender in power, then the other gender, you guys, the males, you guys are the ones who have the power to enact that change and help us to get where we want to be. So it's really important that you guys are here, actually, because Absolutely. we know what we want. Um, it's kind of yeah. getting you guys to help us get there. Yes, absolutely. I think if we were just an echo chamber with just women talking about our own issues, when you know everybody contributes to it, right? Um, then it change is not going to happen. It cannot happen from just one side. So it's yes. Thank can you. I, for can minute. I chime in a bit? Yes, of course. Oh, okay. I heard uh, about human potential. Soraya said uh, Andrew's point about 
doesn't matter which gender, as long as it's, a, it's about the contribution. So I'm, I'm particularly interested or passionate about human potential. And of course that transcends gender, transcends race. You know, I, I think it's a shame, I, can I just say this uh, in public, that for most of our human history that, you know, half of the human race is disadvantaged or not able to manifest or fulfill their full potential. And guess who loses? Guess who loses? All of us. Every single one of us, the human race loses. I think we're at a time when this is particularly important. At a, I think at a point in, you know, in the human evolution that this is particularly important. And I just want to put some uh, in my own view into the context of things with all the challenges that we are facing, right? That some of us are trying to address in our own way. You know, I, I just want to quote, yeah, I, I share this with, uh, I'm into philosophy, right? <laughs> so if I might just share a little bit, I share with, uh, I share with the panelists earlier already, you know, this is from uh, I Ching, which is a uh, 7,000 year old wisdom tradition uh, from, from the East, from China. Yeah, this used to be, a, I Ching used to be, some of you are familiar, I'm sure, maybe even study it. Uh, this was required reading by all the rulers and people who serve kings and emperors in the old days, but somehow it, it got lost, yeah? It became like a fortune-telling book, become a book for feng shui and all that stuff. But back then, this is a great book of wisdom. It says, this is a quote, uh, it has many teachings. Yeah? It says, yi yin yi yang wei zhi dao. It translates to yin and yang, together is the embodiment of everything that's in the universe. Yin and yang, which translates to feminine and masculine. Not male and female, but feminine and masculine, right? Which is the energy that exists in everything. It's an embodiment, it's a combination, it's a union, right? Which is like yoga means union, isn't it? So when, when yin and yang comes in, and, and how do we read this? When yin and yang comes into dynamic balance is when we have harmony, harmony. When we have harmony, when it comes to dynamic balance, is when we have harmony in life, in work, in whatever we do, in families, right? So, uh, so you know, so so I, I guess uh, so we cannot do without the other. Yeah. Yeah. We, and I just look at my own life. My when I growing up, my mom, my mother, you know, she was like she was like the force. She was the power in the family. And, uh, and when I was growing up, my teachers, some of my favorite teachers were, were females. You know, they're, they're the ones who are nurturing, who are encouraging. Uh, I support, you know, in my role as an angel investor and advisor, I supported, I, I invested in female founded startups. Yeah, and, and I've been now having been working in the nonprofit space for the 10 years now, most of the volunteers I work with are female, like 90%, yeah. So I think is that kind of world. I, the is the is the you know to me it's like still the big elephant in the room. Why I think female have I mean let me just say this yeah they are to me they are the you know they are the superior gender. If I may just say that I make a kick out of this panel, <laughs> <laughs> but you know but the S you know the S in the sup, the that's in the super on, on Superman's uh, cape is stands for superwoman right because. Female just have to juggle so many more things. It's my own experience as well. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's time that we raise we raise this level of the conversation. I can Please. change this job or not? Yeah. To this one, uh. <laughs> Oops. I, yeah, um, so I think um, it's the same yeah. N actually yeah. has something that oh. she, she'd like to add as well over here. Oh, finger nail. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I, I, was I already have a cut. Energized by um, you know what the panel has been talking about, and and I was I really resonate with this point about um, women being encouraged to talk more about what they do and and uh, about themselves and about their capabilities. I thought I'd just share a little story because I found myself having this conversation many years ago with a very inspiring woman. She grew up in the United States. So it's a different cultural context, but she was, she's one of the women who left a very deep impression on me because of the way she observes people so closely. I, I think she is a super mentor 
And um, so she's one of those people who told me uh, what she thought I could, I could be more of or do more of. And she wanted me to speak up more um, in work-related context. And so I, I said, I don't feel comfortable with that because it just sounds like bragging. And she looked at me with a very straight face, you know, a very serious tone. And she said, that's nonsense. You're merely helping other people understand your work. And every time when I find that it is important to speak up, I, I will remember her face, her very serious demeanor. And I tell myself, I am helping you understand my work. And I thought I'd just share that because uh, it's really stayed with me all these years. Thank you. That, that's beautiful. I, I think one of the things and that stops people from, from being able to speak out like that is the fear of judgment, right? So when we do impose that or when we perpetuate it, whether as parents, whether as fathers, as, as husbands, as wives, any of these sort of you know, um, stigma, it, it doesn't help. So I think the first thing we can do, you know, is to firstly be aware of some of these things that we have, some of these unconscious biases that are already built into us culturally, or, you know, just, just from, every, even from social media, social media somehow gives a right or somehow dictates a lot of how we should be thinking or how we should not be thinking. And so if you're trying to speak out against that, um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, that, that whole cancel culture and all of that. Um, thank you so much, Sim, Simen, for, for sharing that. Um, I'd like to pick up on, on um, Yen Lu and what you were talking about, because I think you know, let's bring this conversation beyond just the male-female sort of power struggles, right? Because I think we, we agree there, there's, we could have many more conversations about this, but I think also what this points to really is how we as a society um, and as people tend to create barriers, create our own sort of divisions. Um, so anybody would like to just chime in on this and how we can take some of these barriers down without, without making another group seem like we're taking something away from them. Can I? Do yeah. I? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. That's fair. Sorry. No. Yeah. I just wanted to. I just wanted to say I like what you said. You know about the balance and about how we share uh, common humanity. Um, you know, I also like what Leon is doing for men, and just want to give a shout out to men, and also go back to what Jen said. It's not a power struggle, right? Um, one of the questions we discussed before we joined the panel is what are what are the instances of power struggle we're seeing in personal lives and in the workplace? And I would say that, you know, my first encounter would be in the home, right? Where my father worked and my mother didn't. And, you know, as a breadwinner, he had all the power to do what he wants, say what he wants, sometimes very, do very, very hurtful things. And for years, I was very angry with him. Um, you know, I thought it was not right, the things he did, things he said, um, you know, but then my mother actually said to me, um, you know, she pointed to his humanity and said, you know, think about how he grew up. He wasn't taught how to love, mm. right? How would he know how to love? So going back to the topic of toxic masculinity, you know, if men are not taught how to love, how would they know how to love? We need to see them as humans. So another thing would be, um, you know, I said I have, I have three daughters. Well, actually, I have six children because I've had three miscarriages in my life. Mm. Um, two which happened in the past year and you know which I kept really quiet about because it was it was mm -hmm. painful and you know I didn't want to show my female vulnerability in the office I didn't want to tell anyone and just power through continued working even though I was feeling so sick um, you know and then a year after I just posted it on LinkedIn thinking that it was career suicide but I just felt that I needed to give voice to to my well what I thought was female pain but what really struck me after that was you know, a lot of people wrote to me, um, you know, that post was shared a lot. A lot of people wrote to me, but what really struck me was the number of men within my firm and number of male strangers, um, you know, who wrote to me, um, my colleagues who called me. And what struck me was the sense of loneliness they felt and isolation where they shared their experience of having, of loss. You know, like a lot of people can understand when females, when women go through a loss like that, but the men, when they were sharing with me, um, what I heard the most was 
my wife's gone through this. I'm in a lot of pain. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to talk about it. And worst of all, I don't know how to support my wife, right? So they feel like they have this role as this breadwinner and, and protector of the family, but they didn't know what to do, that sense of helplessness. So I think, you know, going back to what Yan Lu says, is really recognizing our common humanity and realizing that, you know, we're all, we're all people at the end of the day, we're all learning. There shouldn't be a power struggle. Yeah, and, and yeah, M Michelle, if I just add chime, you talk about uh, vulnerability. I think one of the things that really came out in a big way during the past 18 months, two years, is the need or, or the call for leaders to be more empathetic and, and being vulnerable to show their human side, you know, because I think everybody, you know, we have this, this is, we have this perfect storm and everybody needs to feel like they're on the same boat, you know, that we all have, we all go through these struggles and it starts by leaders showing their own vulnerability and being empathetic. So what you pointed out, what you just shared, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. And it's actually, it resonates now. It's becoming the thing, you know, leaders need to, to show their human side, being vulnerable, you know, to connect in a way to, and to connect with your people, right? The, the, your employees through mm -hmm. those, you know, sharing the vulnerability and, and being empathetic. Yeah, and, and I think the empathy piece is, is really important because empathy comes from so many, it's a very complex, um, a concept in itself, because uh, I mean, it may sound easy to just say I'm in the other person's shoes, but to understand the person's context, not just, you know, uh, understanding loss, but also understanding where the want and demand came from and understanding the entire journey, uh, Michelle, that you shared. I think that's so important for even, you know, my male counterparts to, to hear it because they are just as much going through it and they're just as clueless and we need to understand and one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is also how do we deal with failure from a stereotypical stigma basis and how that expounds in a very negative masculine way as well. And I, I just wanted to, and I think it's an interesting segue, uh, Jen, that I just touch on one of the points that I think Debbie brought up, which was wokeness in this yeah. whole uh, element of DEI, um, yes. you know, in this world of DEI. And I, I think that, you know, for me, it's, it's the question of, you know, are we, are we playing tokenism for me is when we actually start playing just a tick box game. Now tokenism can have very positive outcomes, which we just talked about. And to, to a degree, I also support it as well. And, and I, I would say that, the, but the biggest difference is about how do we work together to converge culture in thinking? Because at the end of the day, if we don't implicitly believe, if a person doesn't implicitly believe in the potential of the person who happens to be female, then I think we've, we've lost the plot already. And, and if that's the case, then, you know, <laughs> let's not start the race. I think we, we, we need to take a step back and say that, look, everybody has potential. There's so much we can do. And within the, the commercial or the, the environment itself, if I, whether or not for nonprofit volunteers or even for, you know, staff who are paid, I think that, you know, we, we still, we should accept that diversity comes with not just an element of, of a different gender, but it also comes with a, a perspective of different contexts, different needs, different dreams, and different values as well, which we want to bring together. And I, I think that for me is where you know the difference between wokeness in, or, or just people ticking, ticking boxes versus actually people who truly believe intrinsically that women can contribute to the world, will change the world, and need to be given opportunities. Right. And, and tokenism might be one, one pathway to support the next many steps, but we, we cannot forget the intrinsic nature of what it means for males and fellow females when we're supporting, you know, the yeah. elevation of women. Yes, I, I, I you know, that, that tokenism, as, as much as, you know, it, it, it is necessary, it's really just the first step. Like you say, Leon, I think if it opens up conversations, if it allows, um, you know, whoever is being, whose voices are being suppressed to give them a platform and they're able to use that platform and also for others to keep supporting that, I think that, that there needs to be some sustained sort of effort behind that. Um, so it's it is a first step, and that that might that um, might set us in the right direction. Um, but empathy too, I think your piece about empathy is is important. But the empathy only comes about really from from having effective communication. 
you know, for, for people to be able to speak out without feeling they're being judged, without feeling that they're, they're not, they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to, you know, uh, all these other things that's going to happen to the consequences of speaking up. I think when we create um, spaces where, um, which are safe, that's great. When we create spaces that are brave, where people feel that we can also, you know, just be able to say to the other person, you know, what, what you're saying is not all right. You know, what, what you're making feel, made me feel, um, because you don't understand, you know, what I'm going through is not all right. And let me tell you why, you know, it, it makes me feel this way. I think having that sort of a, a allowing for that sort of conversations takes it, you know, a little further step. Right, where we allow for communications to, to happen a little bit more. Um, I hope we have been able to touch on some of these things today and allow for that space to happen. Um, I know we're, we're run, running out of time. Um, so I'm going to invite um, Doreen to come back and I think we're gonna bring everybody else back. Um, we'll have a chance for everyone to, to round up you know, their thoughts um, there is so much here to, to, that we haven't unpacked still, but um, I think it's been wonderful so far. Doreen, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, panel two, for such an engaging and insightful discussion. You're right, there's just so much more time that we wish we had um, to continue with the, the topics from both panels. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I now invite the audience to get back engaged with us and just to give us a little um, thumbs up reaction or any emoji that you wish to put on the screen, um, just to, to answer the question, do you feel your power being reignited um, in line with the topic of our conversation? And in parallel, I invite um, Shimin to post the quiz that we have for everyone. It's a very engaging quiz. I, it's a surprising answer, even for me, as I'll be research the question. Shimin, if I can encourage, uh, get you to put on the quiz right now on the screen. Thank you. So the question, everyone, is when did women get the right to vote in Singapore? You have four and a half options. I'm intrigued to see who picks number five. Um, I'll give you just a couple of minutes um, <laughs> just to engage in that. And while you're working out the answer, we invite all the panelists to turn on their video and to take a question that might be in the chat box that you wish to, en to engage with or to take the minute to give us any last words that you might have. Um, everyone um, who has been on panel number one, number two, and of course, to our two guests of honors, um, if you still uh, encourage you to join us as well. All right, I um, hope that's given you some time to answer the question. Shimin, would you kindly show us the result? <clears throat> now, very interesting. Now, would you believe that the answer is 1948? Here in Singapore, women were given the right to vote alongside men when Singapore's constitution was introduced. That's an incredible fact, isn't it? Um, now, I take the time to hand over the floor to Jog. The floor is yours to address the questions, to do the cool song and close the conference. Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doreen. Wow, what a, what a wonderful discussion we had, the second panel. Well done, guys. And um, Leon, you know, you, I like the fact that you, we, we need to show young women that it is possible to become whatever they want to be. And um, females can do it. And Andrew will continue to remove the hurdles for your entry into RGS alumni events. <laughs> Tell your brothers as well. <laughs> And um, everyone now uh, of the participants, right, of the 100 over participants, right, if you see the uh, QR code there is not the safe entry sign, it's actually the um, QR code for RGS joining the RGS alumni. So if you are, so if you are an RGS girl, please scan now and join the RGS alumni. I have to do this shout out so that we together, we can serve the community and with a stronger force and a bigger voice.
Um, right. Um, all my panelists in? Fantastic. Right. So um, maybe what I'll do this way is to just call everyone um, by name, like step by step, and ask you guys to share within one minute or so um, some last words, you know, together with our countries. You guys have been amazing. So we let panel two relax a little bit. Panel one takes in and then panel two comes on. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shalini. Yes. Uh, hi, Joe. Hi, hi. Uh, well, I, I really enjoyed uh, today's discussions and mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot myself. I think mm -hmm. what my takeaway is, is that, you know, we have to continue to be the change and, and work for change. And we start at home. Uh, with mm -hmm. the men and women that are in our lives and that can we can influence. And uh, I've also very much uh, appreciative to the audience members who have shared very excellent points in the chat. I hope we can continue this discussion and, and uh, make it a fruitful one. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Be the change and work for change. Thank you, Shah. Um, next, I'd like to call on Mr. Chua Juhok. Yeah, okay. I think this uh, this uh, two panels has been great. You know, we hear a lot of points, a lot of inputs from, from all the panelists and great uh, uh, chat in the chat room itself. Um, I guess I just want to, to emphasize uh, one thing, right? You know, gender issues, equality uh, is not about changing the image of men or women. You know, mm. uh, at, the, at, the, at one of the crux of the issue is, you know, the relationship between men and women in society. Mm. Because the actions and attitudes of us men and boys uh, will play an essential role in achieving gender equality. And how do we do it, right? You know, um, parents, we, we need to inculcate from young the values, the principles, um, to tell our kids that you know it's okay to cry, you know it's uh, it's okay to make mistakes, uh, it's okay to express yourself, your love, you know, and and you know you and and all those things that are important, uh, so that we can actually achieve a better uh, gender equality and the way they see uh, both women and men. Mm. I love that. I love that, Juhok that um, it's not about changing, it's not about changing the image of men and women, but it's the attitude of men. I love that to ensure equality. That is such a powerful and courageous uh, thought. You, you are our best allies and I hope you'll lead the charge. And it's so important um, for parents to inculcate values of gender equality. It's all right to cry. In fact, it is necessary to cry sometimes. So thank you so much, uh, Joho. Um, then I would call upon uh, Thai. Thai, share, share with us your Thaiism. Uh, well, my main takeaway from this is that from last time, everybody is everybody has evolved very far. Our relationships have, uh, have been made better since last time. And I think that we should all strive to continue evolving uh, in a positive way. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And Ty, would you like to tell me, as you uh, tell the panelists and, and everyone who's attending, where do you think power comes from? I believe power comes from inside mm. your, you, yourself because it's how you develop the power inside yourself, igniting mm. the power. <laughs> <laughs> and you did some, say something that power comes from love, right? That comes from the heart, right? And um, that's really, really nice, yeah. Thank you, Ty. And um, whom shall I call next? Right, Virginia. <laughs> um, very inspired uh, by the last panel, especially the vulnerability of all of the speakers. Um, I, I was thinking a lot about this. I, I truly believe that empowerment begins in the home. Um, and a lot of the things that I've spent, you know, the last decade thinking about as I did a lot of women's work and then now, you know, now in, in, in venture capital is, um, are we bringing up boys and girls very differently mm. and you know our boys being encouraged to be ambitious and our girls being encouraged to be obedient mm. I mean I think that's also a subset of, of Asian society in general <laughs> for us to be orderly and obedient but um, I, I, I was just thinking you know back to my to my own childhood um, I, uh, I, I give a lot of thanks to my late father whom I lost very young who, who, who brought us up without um, you know, I mean, as a child, I, I really didn't know the difference of being a, a boy and a girl, actually. Um, actually, I just wanted to be just like him. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that, that carries on today, right? 
um, that's love. But at the same time, I feel like, at least in my generation, I think the younger generation is different and actually more and more courageous. But I think there was a huge premium still placed on obedience. And I want to say this loudly, actually, because um, I think if I had been obedient, as I was expected to be, I would never have gone on to do the things that I have gone on to do. I had to fight in many ways, my family, especially my, my, my own mother, actually, the whole way. Um, and, 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 and I want to say this because I think this runs very counter to Asian filial piety. But um, I think your parents love you very much. They want what is good for you, but only you know what is best for you. And I think even more so um, as a woman, if you're going to come into your own power and be truly authentic um, and do, as I think a lot, so someone said in the first panel, to do just do the right thing. Um, a lot of times you have to sort of move away from what is expected of you. Um, you know, to, to you know, to to really move into your own power, and and I see myself changing actually as I grow older. You know, I was much more, I think, inclined to please uh, when I was in my twenties and early thirties, and then now I think as I as as I am, I'm, I'm almost reaching forty. I think, um, you know, I'm I'm I, I just feel um, that we can grow into our own power. I, I'm less worried about what a, anyone thinks, but I I think I don't want to deny, you know, the fact that it came naturally. I felt in many ways when you're choosing an unconventional path, as a lot of us on this panel have, have, have done, I had to fight every step of the way. A lot of, of these barriers came from the home um, and the expectations which are put on us, uh, even with love. And, uh, and, 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 and I want to, to say that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Virginia. Um, that was really important. I think you, under, you, you spoke about the importance to inculcate gender equality, um, you know, uh, the family being, you know, playing an important role in encouraging uh, gender equality. And from young, you wanted to be like your father, same here, but I'm, you know, I'm, I want to be my mother as well. So you can see both my mom and my dad and me. Um, and I think obedience is important, speaking from a point of view of a mummy. Um, Thai, you have something to say about that too, what parents should do in terms of, uh, give, you know, uh, empowering um, children. I mean, I would say that parents should should allow kids to do to do what they want, to explore their interests, and to uh really find a drive for what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, within reasonable limits, but I really think that kids should really find something of their own. Mm -hmm. That is such a mature thought. Um, I like also the fact that you have a self-regulated boundary, like you say, within reasonable limits. You will grow strong and powerful, Thai. And uh, like Virginia say, we'll all grow into our own power and be the best versions of ourselves by doing the right thing. Um, I would like, um, well, Sheehan can't be with us uh, because it is New York time and, you know, um, she's, she's off to bed and just really grateful that she could actually come on to share with us. Um, Georgette, um, Georgette has to step off uh, for personal uh, reasons, and we're just really, really, really grateful that um, she could actually make time to, uh, to be with us. Um, but um, she would like me to share some of the thoughts that she had shared with me uh, during the interview that I had with her um, about how you can ignite the power within uh, for all of us, um, women um, and men too, to seek knowledge, to always read up, get new ideas, and these are for young people, and perhaps even, I'm sure even for older people as well, to constantly seek knowledge, to be curious. So she has the five S's. The second one is support, to always give support to one another. And I'm so glad that we have this community here today to empower, support each other, to give each other a voice. And we must also continue to ask questions, right? Give support, ask for support. She also mentioned this savings, that we should save little by little. You can save for a rainy day or save when there's investment opportunity that comes from all the wonderful investors here, all the wonderful VCs here. When you have the money and they have a startup, go for it. Okay, so saving is very important. And then she mentioned about self. Um, all of us need to be a bit selfish in looking after ourselves because uh, we are always looking after other people but we should take time to um, embrace ourselves too. And I thought that was really good. And the last one, which is right now, 
an asset that we all need. And it's, um, it's sleep, she says. There's restoration power in sleep. I think to my panelists and panelists number two as well, uh, last night, maybe some of us didn't get to sleep as much because we were just so excited, right? Um, there's restorative power in sleep. If you didn't sleep enough, how are you going to empower other people, right? And um, how are you going to recalibrate your life if let's say you don't have enough rest? So um, these are the five assets that um, Georgette uh, has shared. Um, I shall now ask, invite panel number two to share with us. Okay, so first one, Mr. Chow, Yen Lu, share with us some of your last thoughts. Yen Lu? Okay, while waiting for Yen Lu, um, I'll go with uh, Jin Jin. Oh, wow. uh, thank you so much again for having me in this panel. And, um, and I think for me, going back a little bit to what Virginia just said, and I actually want to raise the similar point. I think as much as parents can wish the best for us, I see on my, my, with my own family, they have their self-limiting uh, beliefs as well. I think very often we live in the projection of other people's own limitation and possibilities. Every generation evolves themselves. And if you parents do the best for you, but you need to find the power and the voice within yourself. And for me, um, empowerment, I think someone mentioned also in the um, chat that women need to be kinder to each other as well. And this is something I want to emphasize here as well. It's not I in my professional life, and I think many panelists here can echo with me when you are, you are working in a male-dominated industry. Very often, it's also nice for men to have women. Men actually welcome women to be on the board because just for the sake of having a different voice, very often it's the case that women don't allow other women to be on the board if women are the only one. I experienced in my corporate role, often we sit in a senior director um, boardroom and there are maybe two women. And in the talent review, men often bring up women and in, in a very neutral gender lens because they think women in that case are the better fit. Well, women leaders, they are very territorial because there are so few of us and they are scared that actually young women would raise up and then take their role. And the more women actually raise up their voice, the more we have in the equality in the boardroom and so on. Um, I think this will, this, this, this will allow more women and young women to um, remove self limiting beliefs. And I think empowerment, true empowerment is for us, for men and women is to help young women to remove self limiting beliefs and live their true, true, uh, true self. Thank you. Thank you. I love that, Jinjin. Jin. You know, uh, self-limiting belief, it's, uh, you know, such a blockage in our advancement, isn't it? Um, they're the limiting agents to our success. Um, I also like the, the fact that you say that, you know, women should actually be for women as well, um, because uh, for men, Virginia had mentioned before, for men, they're unlimited doors. They feel that they're unlimited doors. They have unlimited doors, so they don't mind sharing. But sometimes women may feel that we have limited doors and may, uh, you know, hold ourselves back um, from wanting to open them for others. So opening doors for each other is really one of the, uh, you know, powerful ways to, one of the ways to empower one another. Thank you so much. Um, shall I call upon uh, Yen Lu? Hi. Hi. Thank you, George. Yeah. How a wonderful way to, to close this. Uh, let me just summarize my understanding of power. You know, first of all, power is a relationship. Yes. Yeah, that we all talked about between two people, two parties. It comes, uh, it's a choice. I also mm -hmm. heard power is a choice. We can be powerful or powerless every day, right? The choice is up to us. Mm -hmm. uh, power is not, is uh, it's the ability to be able to influence others. Yeah. Yeah. Power mm -hmm. is not just what we do, but who we are. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I heard about something that comes from within. Mm. Uh, and power is, it's not power, for me, it's not power over someone, but power with someone. And, and uh, so let me, let me just uh, summarize, just say a few words about what I, what I think true power comes from, if I may do that. Sure. Where does that come from? Yeah. So power for me is really showing up for life. It's showing mm. up for life. Mm. True, true power comes from the inside. It's the inside out. This is my approach as well in life. Having integrity of the heart, thoughts, words, and action, which are in alignment, that living your values, 
acting from your truth, yeah? Connecting to your higher self. I heard that earlier as well. You know, to rediscover your inner light and creative sparks. It's a sense of coherence that comes from the inside and that radiates outwards, that permeates everything that we do. Uh, so, you know, so again, going back to uh, some, somebody talked about what had to be the change. So I think, uh, you know, I think change, global change, global transformation begins with personal change and personal transformation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. change begins with each of us. We have to be, the, so we have to be the change. Yeah, that's Thank wonderful. You. I love that, Yan Lu. Be the change that we want to see in others. Just be the change first and showing up for life. Super love that. And you mentioned about integrity. And um, that is something that Juhok also mentioned when I in interview with him, that integrity is everything and it determines um, who you are. And, and that came from my mother. Oh, wow. <laughs> ah, yes, that's yes, right. She was a little, she was a diminutive woman. You know, she yeah. doesn't even reach up to my shoulder, yeah. but her spines is like this, yes. that straight. Yes. Absolutely. Integrity of the heart and the and moral character. You know, Absolutely. so I think I took, I think I looked to her for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah. It's, it's just so nice to honor our mothers because um, as uh, someone has said, you know, our mothers um, actually um, make us feel proud to spell our name, W-O-M-A-N. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like to call on Leon. One minute, Leon. You have a lot to say. I love what you say. One minute because we're running out of time. I thought you were going to give me 30 seconds, but this is no, great. No, no, double that. <laughs> I think I took I took your thirty seconds, Leon, too. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, sorry. Because so I would like maybe, to invite Sim An, uh, Minister Sim An, and uh, Xiao Huang as well to speak. Yeah, yes. I want I want to hear that. So I'm going to limit myself. So, so no. two things is um, one, um, you know, living the life of possibility. I mm. think um, you know I, I really liked um, what Jok was saying about asking questions. And, you know, let me be the first to admit, as a male counterpart in a situation which we do contribute to, I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But mm -hmm. I do know that I really want to find the answers. And you know what? If you are asking the questions, you are challenging me in different ways and forms, maybe, you know, I don't have a, a space for women to, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to have their own space at lunch to pump, you know, their breast milk. And you know, well, I don't know how to fix it, but I need to ask a question. And somebody, you know, and sometimes they just never thought about it. I can I'll be honest that sometimes I'm quite thick. <laughs> Let me be, be clear about that. So ask the questions, challenge us, and you never know what you're going to get. Live in a life of possibility, ask. And hopefully the question from what if dot, dot, dot becomes a why not dot, dot, dot. So that, that's really one, one takeaway. And the second is, you know, um, I, I once was interviewing someone in Laos for a scholarship and he was a Buddhist, a young Buddhist monk, an apprentice Buddhist monk. And he basically, when asked about different cultures and perspectives, how do you react to it? And how do you respond to these different challenges? Because people in Laos are very different from people say in, in the US. Well, his response was, was very clear. He said, I'm at home. And when I'm at home, I live in the same room. I have the same parents as my brother. I eat the same food as they do. I go to the same school as he does. And yet we're still different. And we're still fighting. And we're still, you know, different people. And yet in all that simplicity, it's really about bringing it down. And how I take away from it is that we're all people. We, we all are contributing in a positive way, in a negative way. And highlighting it in, in, in a constructive way will, will help all of us. Because I've been in the position of not helping it. And hopefully we get to uh, put our hand up to say, how can we make it better? Mm, that is so beautiful, Leon. Living a life of possibilities. And there's so many possibilities after your, your sharing. It's, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to call upon Michelle. Michelle, please. Hi, everyone. So thanks for having me here today. Um, mm. Just have my final words directed to the RGS girls here. Um, I hear there are some students. Um, the RGS girls here, well, Athena is our mascot, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. But let's not make gods of wisdom and war. It is not a fight about who is smarter or better. That is not true power. As what Thai said, power comes from love. Mm. Love is the true God. So let us elevate love, not war, not intelligence. 
Love is about putting others first. It's about self-mastery. It's about being a servant leader. To the RGS girls, you are going to be in positions of worldly power. So use it for good, to raise others up, to better the lives of those who are less fortunate. Because love will be what makes you do the best work in your life. Mm. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I love that. Power is love. Right? It all comes down to that. Power is love. And as RGS goes, we are expected to serve and um, serve with power for the good of others. We have uh, Dr. Soraya. Congratulations on your promotion as a consultant. Over to you. <laughs> The first thing I want to say is don't go last because everyone would have said what you want to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, minister, first. minister will be the last too. Save the best for the last. Um, yes, I also want to talk to the LGS girls actually. And I also <laughs> wanted to use Athena as an example. So Michelle, but I wanted to just reach out to the girls, the young girls here, because you know we've talked about such heavy topics on a Saturday morning, hmm. but for the teenager who's 15 and watching this and thinking, will I ever get there? Will I ever have a career, have a family, have it all? Yes, you will. It will be a struggle because gender inequality and all these problems will not go away in the next 10 to 20 years. And you will have to fight your way to get to where you want. But we were all there once upon a time. You know, I was an RGS girl questioning myself, can I do it? You know, will I make my parents proud? Will I make myself proud? And you will. So just make sure when you think about the question, can I just turn it around to I can and you can. And when you get there, make sure you look out for the other women or the other girls who are struggling to get where you are and help them. And together we can empower each other. Mm. That's wonderful. I love that sharing. I can just imagine myself holding a placard that says, can I? And into the mirror, it was says, I can. Thank you so much for that powerful sharing. Um, I'll call up uh, Senior Minister of State, uh, Anne, and then uh, Xiao Huang, uh, Minister Xiao Huang. Thank you, everybody. Such amazing and inspiring sharing from all of our panelists. As you were all speaking, uh, and I was also uh, looking at the chat bar, um, a thought occurred to me, which is that when we do women's conferences in different contexts, a very common uh, question that's posed to women speakers is, you know, how do you do it all? And, you know, sometimes it's even the title of the conference. And I, I think it's great that, um, you know, we, we talk about something quite different, igniting the power within, but the two are related. They are related because you know, we, I think we all accept that um, as women, particularly women in Singapore, um, we do benefit from many dismantled barriers to our advancement. Uh, and of course, you know, along the way, I think we get a lot of support from men. But um, as I've mentioned at the start, I think there are still some mindsets that remain quite obstinate and they are really not so easy to... Um, uh, to, to, to dismantle uh, or to eliminate. And it, it's going to take time. And I feel that perhaps the idea that, you know, women can exercise power, but, you know, we have that expectations that we do everything to very high standards, you know, or even to perfection. Uh, and really the idea that, you know, I think this came up during our discussions, you know, we have to be firm and yet gentle, you know, we have exercise power, but, you know, we still uh, sort of remain in touch with our feminine side, you know, uh, make decisions, but not step on toes and so on and so forth. Actually, that balancing act, um, I think just automatically disqualifies so many of us from being good leaders, you know, or good wielders of power. And what I want to say is I think stand, this kind of standards of perfection is a new form of oppression. And I think we should be the first to free ourselves from that. And this is very, very uh, important to me, especially when I think of our young students, because um, there, there are so many signs that point to this impossible standard of, standards of perfection affecting not just adult women, but also those who are younger. And, you know, and I think that's why there is a conundrum 
Why are our students getting more and more accomplished? And yet some of them are feeling less and less worthy. Mm. We can't, I think, let this conundrum continue. We have to break out of this paradox. And so uh, I, I think, you know, let's continue to recognize, you know, where I think true oppression is. Uh, and, you know, I, I completely echo what Xiao Huang said, um, the barriers that we can break for ourselves and others, let's put all our energy behind tackling those. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, uh, in another 20 years time, another group of panelists having this conversation, um, we would then be able to look back on the further progress that we have made. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Anne. This will be a time capsule so that in 20 years' time when we open it, we'll see how the conversation has progressed. Indeed, we need to be good wielders of power to empower other people so that when, as people feel more accomplished, they also feel more worthy. Um, I will go now to ask uh, Minister Gan to uh, share her last words, uh, being, you know, being with the, uh, uh, what do you call that, Air Force? You know, you break barrier, sound barrier all the time. So I'm going to invite you to say the last words. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and the uh, points shared uh, this morning. I'm really glad to be part of this uh, great conversation. Um, I thought, you know, um, it's useful to link um, the concept of power to um, the concepts of passion and purpose. Um, we, we spoke a bit about that, uh, but really, you know, um, there are different definitions of success in life. Um, and whatever we do, I think, you know, we must be passionate about it. Uh, it must be purposeful. Um, only then, I think, the power will flow naturally. Um, and yes. nothing can really stop us, you know, uh, men or women, if, um, we are, if we believe in ourselves, if there's a cause that we are pushing for. And to the young RGS girls who are in this session, um, I ask that you pursue your dreams. Mm -hmm. There are really different paths to success um, and it's not possible to have it all. Um, I can tell you that, you know, I'm almost 50 years old. Um, I have wow. great girlfriends, you know, and I can tell you that um, um, everyone is happy in her own way. You know, the former RGS girls whom I'm still keeping in touch with after 30 years, um, you know, many people are successful in their own ways, in, you know, in the workplace, at home, in the community, doing social work, just being themselves. I think that is the true, true meaning of power. Thank you. Mm. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Xiao Huang. It's um, very, very nice sharing on passion, purpose. And for a conference about power, there's so many P's here. Power, passion, purpose, pursue your dreams. There are many pathways in life. And Leon, many possibilities. And I'll put that as dot, 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 power. Um, I like um, to, at this time, acknowledge my entire kampong for helping me to uh, organize this conference. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge Jen, my chair. Jen Lo, thank you very much for chairing the conference, not just this one, but also our first two ones. Fantastic, fantastic job. And people in our task force, Shuli, Belinda, Doreen, Eileen, Elise, Genevieve, Waiter, Debbie, and my perfect dream team at the Exco, who has worked hard to bring RGS alumni to where it is today, and will continue to work hard to build our community together and to build a legacy together for all of us. At this point, I'd like to also share with you our school song. We'll end the conference. I'd like to call the conference to a close, but before that, we'll play the school song. And um, the school song actually has uh, many values that we're committed to. Um, as we sing it, um, think about the words, and uh, we'd like to share them with you. Thank you so much, everyone. But before we start, can, can I just say a few words here? Oh, yes, of course, Jen. Yeah, so... Um, well, thank you. Thank you firstly to, to everybody who spoke today, mm, um, oh yes. our guests of honors, our panelists, um, for taking time out. I think it wasn't just today, but all the time that we've spent, you know, in the interviews and all the discussions we've had leading up to today. 
um, it's a lot of time, but everybody is paving a way here for somebody else, you know, and making it, giving permission to somebody else to, to, to be able to do what you do. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to Job for, for championing this and um, for, for pulling this all together and a wonderful team that we have um, with the committee. Everybody who nominated somebody, um, there were so many nominees this year for speakers. Um, we're going to be keeping in touch with all the, a lot of the nominees mm -hmm. um, and just wanted to thank everybody for all, all your involvement today um, on court and off court. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jen. Oh, it's fantastic. And there's one very, very important person that um, we have to acknowledge as well. Um, our CTO, uh, Shimin, who has run this conference so well. All the publicity, all the outreach. Um, she worked tirelessly. She was the last to sleep last night, uh, first to get up. And I'm really, really thankful to you, Shimin. Uh, from wherever you are, you know, I know you're somewhere in the cyberspace, but we are safe in your hands. Um, I also like to uh, ask the panelists and our two guests of honors to stay behind um, because we're, she's going to aspirate us to the breakout room after the school song. After the school song, also our QR code will remain there. So I'm again uh, reminding our chess girls to please scan it and join the RGS alumni. Okay, so um, Shimin, over to you to please uh, play our school song. And I'd like to invite everyone, even whether RGS girls or not, to just sing with us. Floats to us the glory. On us the Savior, tired we sent. Rise, sisters, rise. The world is all before you. We are not to grasp what fortune says. Sisters, sisters, a little the sun shines high above us, and you the 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 powerful and I can hear a baby RGS go in the making right you know and she won't hear he or she or an RI boy or you know just a very powerful young person waiting to come up and I'd like to end this session by quoting one of the pen, uh, one of the um, audience who says change starts with, with an idea that's shared I think today we shared with many shared many ideas and um, we also um, uh, going to be very much more empowered after this conference. I hope, and we hope, um, that would be your best takeaway, to be empowered, to ignite your own uh, lives and not ignite the lives of others. Um, and actually, thank you, Shimin. Right before we end, um, I'd like to uh, share with you two very exclusive offers for the participants. Um, one is uh, from She Loves Tech. Um, this is a global event organized by Virginia Tan, her comp uh, she has set up um, this um, event competition for startups, 50% discount for all participants. You just have to have this discount code keyed in to the link that she'll put on the chat group. 
Um, she means there's another um, exclusive offer being given by Parkway Radiology. The uh, C CEO of Parkway Radiology is an RGS girl, and she has kindly offered um, breast screening um, at a very exclusive rate for the participants. Of course, terms and condition applies, one of which is you must be a woman most of the time. And uh, yeah, with that, I call the conference to a close and I look forward to seeing you all at our future events. And this is the QR code for RGS Goals to work on. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>